Spirit caused me to realize that regardless of our age, regardless of our body and what our body will do for us, that it is our spirit and our mind that first determines what is possible and will give us the determination for what can become probable. When we determine that we were going to do, we gather in. Apart from the ability to bring people together back to the parishes of their birth, we felt that we had to have a component that allowed conversation to take place. We have had done so in circumstances where people are disposed or inclined to want to utilize other mechanisms that may regrettably lead to loss of property or loss of life. That people too often that have different views, that look different from us, that practice different religions, that behave differently. But in understanding that, we can either choose to focus on the differences that separate us, or we can remember that we both have two eyes, and two ears, and a nose, and a mouth, and in most instances, have bodily parts that are the same in terms of organs, have the ability to be able to celebrate and to emote. And those are the things that unite us. So what is our choice? What can we focus on that allows us to see the commonalities among each other while at the same time respecting the differences that we have each of us? We live in a world today where perhaps the greatest threat to global stability and civilization is not in the area of the economy, but is in the area of religion. We live in a world where we have not yet come to terms with how to bridge the differences. But the one thing I know, and we have learned it perhaps on 166 square miles better than most, even if we don't always want to confront it, is that dialogue and conversation first outlines what our respective positions are. And once we can have that, then we can start to refine the mission as to where we need to go. As Bajans would tell you, for my one part, I believe that we have to up our game. And we have to up our game, and I say so not in a disrespectful way, but we have to recall that there are others doing much of what we do, and people have choices. And we have to up our game first for ourselves, and then for those who want to do business, or who want to interact with us at different levels. Equally, we have to celebrate that amongst us, we already have people who have excelled. And how do we use these persons who have excelled to inspire others who are still trying to figure out where, where do they fit in this place? And how can they make a difference? How can they do things differently? How can they innovate? How can they even fit in, in some instances? And I want, you know, every time I come to St. Lucy, I like to sit down, but not from up there. And I can do this because I can't see people with those lights. And I need to see some people. But I want us to begin a conversation nationally and to continue to talk with each other because that is the only way we are going to build the consensus for movement. And I share with you that when we became the government in 2018, the very first meeting on the Monday morning after the cabinet was sworn in was with the social partnership. The labor unions, all of them, the private sector associations, organizations, all of them, representatives of the government and the cabinet, and the first question I asked was, because the biggest problem facing the country was the value of the Barbados dollar. 
And once we were able to establish who in here wants to save the dollar, then we go around the room and start to work out what are your ideas for it, what are yours, what are yours, what are yours. And by the time we finish the morning session, we realize that 75 to 80% of the suggestions actually coalesce. And if they coalesce, the hardest part of the mission is overcome which is setting out the road way, the pathway towards being able to achieve the mission. Well, I'm happy that we have achieved that mission. But the next mission now is how do we become world class? How do we up our game? And recognizing that I may start this conversation, I would love to finish it, inshallah, but I may or may not. This country must finish it. This country must pause and begin to understand that we coasted for too long in the last two decades and that we have to dig deep down now to put in the early work for the next 50 years and that we have to start to understand that 50 years really is not even a long horizon. But at the very least, we must be prepared to stay the course if we are going to change the reality and the experience of these persons. Now, I've asked for young people, because those older, like me, might have somebody visiting me 50 years from now, as I did this evening, if I'm around. But those who are younger, like you, Puffy, and others in here, Matthew, you, you guys, more likely than not, are going to be living. And you guys need to be able to start to craft the kind of Barbados and the kind of world that you want to live in. And I say world because we've been consistent since 2006 in making the point that we have to produce global citizens, but with Barbadian roots. We have been a country that has been accustomed to seeing people leave our shores and do well. Last independence, we were able to accord to Eric Holder this nation's highest award in the freedom of Barbados oh. for his achievements throughout with respect to the law and becoming the first black attorney general of the United States of America, but not just that achievement, but the substantive achievements as attorney general that he has made and the continued work in redistricting to ensure that populations are not marginalized and that the franchise of the vote is not devalued or minimized. There are others who have not been born here but have adopted here as their homeland and have made a fundamental difference to this country. We want to thank you. And then there are others who have come by descent, and there are others who have come by marriage, and there are simply others who have come by choice. I am not sure that we understand how blessed we are as a people and as a nation. But in understanding how blessed we are, Karen Goodridge, and I thank you for once again accommodating us it is important to understand that that house, however pretty it is, if it is not maintained, it's not going to work for those who live in it, and it's not going to survive. If you don't flush the toilets regularly, they're going to stop working after a few months. If you don't turn on the taps regularly, they're going to stop working after a few months. If you don't clean areas, the dust eventually causes the wood to degrade, and once the wood starts to degrade, the water starts to get in, and a whole insidious process of rotting starts. Why this conversation? Because we have to open the windows to the nation and air the house. We have to open the windows to the nation and air the house of Barbados. And we will do so not just by hearing the traditional voices who people, the leadership of this country and the parliament and the church and the private sector and the unions but by allowing all voices to start to contend 
Jason, your perspective as a young Barbadian that has known what it is to come to leadership at an early age of men, in some instances older than you, in countries that you never perhaps dreamt that you would have to be functioning from. That is a story that has to be told in order for other young people to understand what is possible and where you can go. Puffy, yours, with respect, to being able to do it through music and to do it in a completely different dynamic is one that has to be told. There's a young Barbadian lady who has become the first head of a college at Cambridge as a black woman. <clears throat> and I can go on. There's a young Barbadian man who is at the forefront in Singapore in artificial intelligence. I was in Abu Dhabi and Dubai for two days this week. And as I walked in the Dubai world ports, one of the first people that met me is a Barbadian woman who is heading up HR in that office. I didn't expect to meet her. So that the point that I'm making to us all is that if we are going to inspire a people to a higher calling. We have first to hear what is in people's heads, to listen, and then to begin the conversation. I've spoken about some of the positive and inspirational things, but there are some things that are of concern to us too. And then how do we bridge the gap where that gap has not been bridged in the house, or in the school, or in the church, for those particular individuals who may not essentially be bad people, but they've not been taught that there's a time and a place for things. And how do we continue to use the media that we have, Alison, in a way that it used to be used 30, 40 years ago to reinforce language first and foremost? Because language is a tool that we use to express ourselves and to resolve conflict and to indicate what we want. But how do we use it also to educate? And I've asked my press secretary to launch two major public education courses this year. One is time and place. And the other one is one that goes far beyond that. And it has two words. How to. How to. You may well teach people how to get a mortgage. How to learn to play and be a DJ, how to take care of my responsibilities as a mother with children that may be disadvantaged, how to do so many different things that people <clears throat> may not necessarily know on their own, but which the country needs to share the knowledge in order to empower people. The last point that I'd like to make before opening up the floor is that we need to do this by strengthening the units that lift the nation. I spoke, I think, when I did the New Year's message about being able to help the 650 most vulnerable families in this country. And people ask why. If we can secure a family, then the family is going to secure all of the members in it and then their neighbors. And then in some instances, they'll go beyond their immediate family and neighbor to the rest of the community and to the rest of the country. The family is the most empowering unit as human beings that we have. And we have to therefore recognize that if it takes a village to raise a child, then it takes a nation to save our families. And I want Barbados to unite, Barbadians to unite, and to recognize that it is our solemn duty to be able to take care of each other. Not by handing out, per se, because the money side of it can be raised and can be done. But it's about holding people's hands and helping people process decisions, helping people understand how to get through problems. One of the reasons why I want BCL Cricket back again, strong in this country, is because it gives us a space where people from different backgrounds and different races and different ages can come together and get to know each other. And in knowing each other, 
all of a sudden a fellow who is 16 says to a man who is 40 something who is there playing cricket with him every week and who the boy has no male presence in the house and he has a problem because he gone and get a girl pregnant and he don't know what to do don't have no money don't have no job don't know where to turn don't know how to talk to his mother or the grandmother or the sister but if he's in a space where he's interacting with men who are open and who are caring, then he's in a position to say, so and so, so and so, so and so, I could talk to you. And all of a sudden, the dynamics of the society start to change. So as we open up the windows to the nation to allow air to come through, let us also build the platforms that allow people of different backgrounds to develop relationships, to be able to understand that in life, anyone who does not ever express doubt is not human. At some point, people need people to speak with and to understand what they're going through. And this is the kind of caring society that I want us to engender. But I know this, as much as I want it, or as much as a few of you in here may want it, it will not happen by serendipity or by accident. It is only going to happen when many hands make light work. And many hands can make light work by supporting those families that are tottering or have fallen down. And when they stand back up, what are they then doing? Helping to lift the weight to make sure that many hands make light work on this mission to make Barbados the best place that we can make it. Barbados must work for Bajans, for Caribbean people, and for all who visit it. Barbados must also ensure that we can create a space where people feel safe, where they're comfortable, where they're educated, where they're healthy, where they have access to the basic opportunities that can make a difference in their lives. Barbados must stand for something among Bajans, but equally internationally, so that people understand that. You know how many times I go into meetings and people want you vote internationally or whatever. I've got very clear in telling them we don't ball googlies. <laughs> we don't ball googlies. We ball in the ball very straight. <laughs> and why? Because the relationship matters, not the transaction. The relationship matters, not the transaction. And the relationship must matter because trust is one of the most important assets that a nation can have. A reputation loss is hardly ever regained. And who we are and what we stand for must mean something internationally, but it must also mean something among each other, such that we can make judgments about each other that are reasonably safe as to how we are likely to behave and treat one another. So my friends, with those few words, I'd like to hand back over to the organizers and spend the rest of the evening listening to you. And I've brought, when you see me writing, it's because I'll be making notes from here. We are in the process of our estimates now. And believe you me, I listen a lot more than you think in terms of how to position and where to position what we have to do in this nation. But let us understand that this is just our turn to carry the baton in this leg of the relay. But if we are going to be serious about repositioning this nation, the first thing is to accept that it is a relay race. And there are those who went before that have brought us safe thus far, and there are those among you here who will come after who will continue to keep us safe. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing you. But we're going to interact and cooperate with the moderation, so... Who wants to get the ball rolling?
Well, actually, um, Prime Minister, we thought that this would be a great opportunity to invite Jason Holder. Sounds um, good. <laughs> to talk about I know you as a, I didn't know you were... You want to do the opening balling? I thought you were off today. <laughs> but it seems as though there's no off day for you either. <laughs> How are you, sir? I am a little relaxed. <laughs> but it's good to be here. A pleasant good evening to one and all. Um, yeah, I'm just coming off a of hauling and I expect to open the bowling or batting tonight. But, <laughs> you know, it's good to be here in St. Lucie. I um, haven't been here for a little while and um, the wind definitely feels a little cooler down, down here. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. With this conversation, relax yourself. Um, <laughs> I, 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 associate St. Lucy, as I said, with being able to be reflective. And those who have ever heard me speak in St. Lucy know that every speech I've given has been one that's reflective. So let's just talk. There's some people who might be listening to us, but don't mind. But um, as a young Barbadian right now, where do you see the opportunities? Where do you think the country needs to go, given your exposure internationally? given where you have traveled, what are the differences that you see internationally as compared to what you're seeing here? And where do you think we need to bridge the gap to go further? Um, it's an interesting question, to be fair. Um, you know, I was sat there just thinking of as to how this evening will go. Um, I wasn't too sure what to expect. Um, but one of the things that I've been obviously open to is different cultures. You know, I've traveled the world a fair bit. You know, I've seen... Um, poverty and I've seen the riches of riches of riches um, to be fair and look I think as a country we just need to obviously develop consensus as to where we want to go um, we've definitely got to put our, put our heads together we got we got to understand that you know there will be hardship you know and through hardship you know you would definitely reap the rewards if you stick together and, and have that consensus I think one of the things for me that I've learned um, as a leader in cricket you know is sometimes you may not have that full consensus or full buying from everyone but it's a matter for you just sit and talk it out with, with each and every individual until you get that consensus and until you get that consensus for me is the only way you can move forward it makes no sense you having you know 10 players who are buying in and one who's not you know that one player who's not buying in you know definitely could could be detrimented towards the squad and towards the results of the common goal that we're looking toward looking towards so i think I could probably relate that to the country as well. You know, we as a people, we just need to buy in to, to what the leaders are, are, are bringing to us. You know, we definitely have to have interaction, as you said. And I think with the interaction, obviously, Ben, you know, we can have that common consensus and, and we could generally move forward as, uh, forward as a country. Uh, and what happens if you can't get consensus? Well, there's always a Yorker. I guess that's... <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's your Yorker to negotiate. <laughs> and, and it's a real point. I mean, look, we're having a conversation. Look, I think you're absolutely correct that your first effort is always to bring about consensus. Because if you have consensus on the mission, and then you have consensus on the tactics, the pathway, then you're likely to succeed. But there are some times when you won't have consensus. And do you leave it unaddressed? Or do you make the decision and move forward? Yeah, I guess in tough times you have to make tough, tough calls. Um, and that's the point. Yeah, we've got to we've got to make tough calls. But as a part of the group, you know, I for one may not always buy into what's being preached, you know. But for me, it's it's about the, the team's effort. You know, it's it's not about me personally. It's about being what's best for the team. Yeah, and if you've got individuals on a team or a squad who understand that. You know, we need to be pushing as one in one direction. Then sometimes you may not definitely have uh, agreement from everyone, but because of the common goal, you know, you just get along with it because of the, 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 the goals that you're, you're looking to achieve. So I think for, 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 us, for us as leaders, you know, we just need to know the individuals that we're working with and, you know, find ways to, to bring the message across. Sometimes you've got to be a little firm with people. Sometimes you've got to massage egos, you know. It's just about understanding different dynamics that you have within, um, within your field. And I guess I'm trying to relate everything to cricket. So for me, just trying, to, <laughs> just trying to understand my players, you know, my teammates, and, and, and knowing how to get the best out of them, you know. Again, every day you may not 
feel the same way and, and feel up to up to the task, you know. But you've got to you've got to put on our face. You've got to be strong enough mentally and physically to go to go out on the park and, and achieve. Um, there've been many a times that I've, I've woken up very stiff and sore, you know, not feeling a hundred percent. But I understand the bigger picture. There are people who are paying to come and see us, you know. It's it's something that we're doing for people who love and adore cricket, and for me that's my motivation as well. So. You know, you've got to suck it up. You know, you've got to sometimes take painkillers to ease the pain. I know, get it on the park and make sure you're doing a job, you know, for your people. I, I think Peter Phillips is smiling because he's heard this a couple of times from me. <laughs> so that, but if I had to ask you, if you wanted to wish one thing for young Barbadians, for us to be able to do for or provide for, what would it be in order to be able to allow the average young Barbadian to lift a game in whatever discipline? Um, it's funny you ask the question because um, prior to my tour of India, I went back to the St. Michael's School and you know, I just tried to interact a, lot, a little bit with the kids there. Um, but one of the messages that I put forward to them was communication. I just think it's, it's, it's at a time in, 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 our, in our upbringing where we, we get so consumed by television you know, um, obviously video games, you know, cell phones, but, you know, you obviously miss that interaction sometimes with older people. I always tend to hang around a lot of older people because I feel as though they've always got stories to tell. And I like to sit down and listen to old people chat because you, you, you can learn so much from them. You know, I'm kind of old school in terms of the cricketing um, fraternity where I would stay back in the dressing room just to socialize online. Whereas now, nowadays you've got players who play the game, you know, and as soon as the game is finished, they hop in the cars, hop in the, hop, in, hop whatever transportation they, they got there with, and they're off back to their houses. So I think communication goes a long way. You know, you've got to be able to, to articulate your points across. You know, you've got to be able to interact with many different people, um, especially if you're looking to, to be diverse in different cultures. Um, it's all about understanding the, the different dynamics of different cultures. And I think as young people of Barbados, you know, we just need to, to work on our communication skills. You know, you may have an idea or you may have a, a, a different perspective on life, but how do you get that message across? You know, and it's all about you articulating yourself, you know, having, having that ability to reason and, and get your point across. What about your resolution of conflict? Well, that's an ongoing battle, I believe. Um, look, we, we've got to understand that you're not going to you're not going to have. Well, everybody's not always going to be in your corner. You're not going to agree with everything that everybody does or everybody says. But you know, for the for the sake of peace, you know, you just need to understand that sometimes I've got to bite my tongue. You know, sometimes I've got to you know accept that this may not be the time and place. You know, I heard you mention time and place, and sometimes. Again, relating it back to cricket, sometimes I may have uh, or may have a, a point to, to get across a player and critique, critique his game, but it may not be best suited for the team environment. It may be a situation where you pull him one side and have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with him. And that's just me understanding the time and place and also understanding the individual. You know, he may take it to heart if I do it in front of everybody else. But um, if I pull him one side and I say, well, you know, put, him, put my hand around his shoulder or I say, well, look, let's go for a drink. And let's sit on chat about, you know, how things went. For me, then the message is, is, is definitely taken differently. And I think, just think it's, it's important that younger people, uh, you know, try to put the egos aside, put the emotions aside sometimes and try to understand um, the, the dynamic of the other person and where they're coming from. Now you see why I'm so proud of this young man. Youngsters who don't get involved in sports, how are we going to work to get more of our young people involved in sports or the arts? I feel that, for example, that most sports teach us how to be a team player. I feel that the arts allows us to be able to empathize and to think about others and how others feel. And the government has set a simple target that by the year 2030, the majority, if not all, of our children under the age of 18 should be, one, be able to be bilingual so that they speak more than one language, and I don't mean English and Bajan. <laughs> Two, that they can swim, because you cannot live an island on an island and not be able to swim, both literally and metaphorically. <laughs> it is a constraining factor. Third, 
have been exposed to play in a sporting team, four, exposed to the arts, and five, be taught about business and taking risk. Because at the end of the day, nobody owes us a living, and we have first and foremost to provide for ourselves or to be able to provide for ourselves. Having set those five goals, I'm asking you, if you were in my position, how would you set about getting a greater percentage of young Barbadians involved in sports and artistic activity? Um, I think it definitely has to come from the, the school setting. You know, obviously that's where it starts um, from primary school. You just need to have the kids exposed to as many sports as, as possible. I, I don't believe in limiting people, so I'm just opening up the resources, you know, maybe get sports that we as Bajans are not accustomed to, you know. For instance, I think rugby is something that's really become a lot more prominent in Barbadian cultures. I must tell you, I was shocked at the amount of young girls at the Frederick Smith School who told me when they're going from the school visits that they're now playing rugby. Yeah, so again, you just need to open up the opportunities for, for the young people of Barbados. Um, I've obviously been around the world, as I said before, and the, the, the school cultures are a little bit different. Where they tend to push the, 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 sporting, the sporting culture from a very, very young age. You know, that infrastructure is obviously there for them. They've obviously got the finances and the resources to, to develop their, their younger people um, a little bit better than we do. But I still think with our limited resources, or our resources, for, um, for lack of a better phrase, we, we can do a lot better. You know, just having those opportunities open for, for younger people and, and not limiting them, you know, giving them enough time to, to have choice, you know, whatever they want to do. It may be swimming, it may be road tennis, it may be boxing, you know, whatever it may be, you know, just having the resources for them. Can I put a variant to you? Because, you see, when you do it in schools, children are still mixing with children and with adult coaches. But when we start to do it in communities, as I said just now, like BCL, then we're creating a space where people of different generations, different backgrounds, different races, sometimes even different genders, come together to play. Yeah, exactly. Um, one of the things I've said a lot is to bring first-class cricket back into the communities. And it's funny we're here in St. Lucie because... <laughs> Don't, 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 don't mind him. He recovered fast. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> um, here in St. Lucie, um, I remember as a youngster coming down to North Stars Cricket Ground and watching Barbados play first-class cricket. And I've said to, to a number of personnel at the West Indies Cricket Board, I think we just need to up, upskill our, up, upskill our um, community grounds and, and just upskill most of the facilities there and take the cricket back into the communities because I feel as that that's where... The, the, it's, it bring, brings the people back, back out to cricket. You know, it's, it's a situation where people can just walk on the road to their community ground, come and watch cricket, picnic, you know, and, and the atmosphere is a lot better. I'd rather play cricket in front of hundreds of people as opposed to playing cricket in, in front of 10 people. You know, sometimes when we have first class cricket at Kensington Oval, for, for, <laughs> we're down to numbers, probably about 100 people come to watch cricket. Uh, I think if we take the, the cricket back to the communities, we had lots of good atmospheres at Carlton, Windward Cricket Ground, St. Philip, North Star Saints, St. Lucy. And for me, I, I prefer that. You know, sometimes the grounds may not be um, of standard, but I believe we can put some money into the grounds and make sure that they're of standard so we can get first-class cricket and, uh, and probably local cricket a little bit more back into the communities. Um. I want to thank you, Jason. We probably may call you back. I'm not sure who next is up. Yeah, Roshana. Hi, good night, Jason. So just before you go, a quick question. Um, you are a leader. You travel around the world, and I think that has to be a bit taxing on your mental health. So how do you cope and deal with your mental health and make sure that you're in good frame of mind before you go to play and just in general? Um, very good question again. I recently just came back from a holiday and I guess many of you know that I've taken a break from, the, from this series, this current series going on against Ireland. And I just felt it was necessary, you know, I felt mentally exhausted, physically exhausted as well. You know, last year was pretty hectic in terms of our schedule and this coming year is, is probably even more hectic. So, and I asked for a break because obviously I was a little jaded and um, playing every single format for West Indies is very, very taxing. And not only physically on the body, but mentally as well. 
and for me the traveling takes a toll on my on my body as well too so I needed time to get away from it and the last two and a half weeks I've just been completely away from cricket haven't really been following it and and then I have a pretty good support system around in terms of my friends and family so I think that's also very, very important as well too, you know, having people around you who can always up, uplift you and, and give you that, that confidence and, and that sanity sometimes where, where you would definitely need. You know, we're constantly under scrutiny and, you know, we cop a lot of criticism. So having a good support system around you, I, I think, is very, very ideal. I could give you the manual on criticism. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to just stay the course and stay focused. Ironically... That's the advice that the lady, one of the ladies this evening that was present in the home that I went to visit the centenarian, and she said to me, if I can tell you something, don't look left, don't look right. Stay focused. So obviously it has endured and helped others. I want to thank you, though, for sharing, because I'm also aware that the task of sharing is not an easy one. And I thank you for stepping out and helping us begin the conversations. Um, because just as you felt that you needed to relax and you weren't sure where this is going, the majority of people out there feel the same way. So we're going to get through this. And not just with the people talking on stage, but I want to leave room and time for the audience to be able to talk. Is there anyone who wants to ask Jason any other questions before he leaves? Yes, Well, yes, you do, because they're taping. Yeah, they're recording. Can we just have somebody who carries the mics to people? Because that might be quicker if they're, or, or they're not wireless. Okay. Hi, Jason. Hi, Gregor. Um, one of the things that I see most, particularly in boys at school, is their fear of failure. They don't want to try because they don't want to fail. So I know it's a big question, but if you could possibly, um, in your view, three things. It could be social interaction, it could be something to do with teaching, it could be an environmental answer. What are three things that you think would help, let's say, the average teenage boy in secondary school from 12 to 16 face that fear of failure and overcome it? Because it's going to have to be some kind of support. What would be the three big things for you? Tough question. <laughs> um, I think you've got to fail. You know, you've got to take that step to fail first. And I think it's very important you understand what failure feels like. And then on the flip side of that, I think you, know, you, you, know, you need to put yourself in the environment where you, you understand success as well too. And then for me, it's just about striking a balance. Um, all of us are naturally um, afraid of failure. And it's, it's part of us, you know, as people. So for me, the quicker you accept that, you know, for me, the easier it is to deal with. You know, I myself still struggle to deal with failure, and it's, it's an ongoing battle. But for me, I've found different coping mechan mechanisms as to how to how to put it behind me, how to how to get past it. And for me, it's just setting a goal or setting a few goals. You obviously have process goals, but just staying, trying to stay on course for it. Um, it may not always happen at the uh, or go, going to the in the time span that you're looking at, but. For me, I just try to just try to stay very, very focused on, on on the end result. And for me, once I have that end result in mind, you know, you you have your process goals, and you know, just try to to stay on that plot. And again, I believe in having a strong support system. I can't do it all alone by myself. You know, you need to have strong people around you, who understand you and who understand you know when you're down, who understand how you are when you when you're up. And again, it's just about finding that balance, striking that balance, and you know, finding different coping mechan mechanisms. I, I want to add to that because that's my experience too. Failure is something we need to teach people how to navigate. Um, the first time I ran in an election, I lost. Now, I could have followed up and get upset and whatever. The next the election result came 3 o'clock in the morning. By midday, I was back in the constituency the next day. Just preparing to work again. Because as you said, you just have to stay the course and to stay focused. Um, there was a time when I first became a young lawyer that I felt that you had to win every case. And then you begin to realize that that's not what your mission is. Your mission is to be able to represent your client to the best of your ability. And that equally, 
that her A is not only 100%, her A is 75 or 80% and up. So that people judge you based on your trajectory. Perfection belongs to the divine, Karen Goodridge. And, and that is part of the problem that we have in raising our children and raising our young people. They cannot manage and negotiate failure. And the disappointment becomes anger in some instances and the lashing out flows from then. I learned as well, even going back to the same politics, politicians who lost on the first outing know how to lose throughout their career. Those who lose for the first time after 15 or 20 years are devastated and can't find the center again. It's true. It's true. So that when we lost government in 2008, for me it was par for the course. Why? Because I don't feel like eating fish every day. I don't feel like eating chicken every day. I don't feel like eating pork every day. I don't feel like eating steak every day. Now, if I can admit that I have different tastes for different moments, other people can also say that I feel that you're the person for the moment. But five years or ten years from now, they'll say, I feel you, Puffy, are the person for the moment. So that people have the right to make decisions. But we begin to believe that it is always about us rather than understanding the context and the environment within which people are functioning and why failure may occur sometimes. So that one of the things that strikes me is this generation's absolute interest in confronting mental health issues in a way that is positive and that requires us to understand that because a person may have some mental health challenges does not mean that their life is written off because there is both medication and counseling that can bring them back to being highly productive citizens. So I, I thank you for being open as to how you navigate failure, because too many people want perfection without understanding that that's not what life is always about, that we would love it, but sometimes the pursuit of perfection is the obstacle to progress. Any, anyone else before Jason goes? Jason, they like they don't want you to leave. <laughs> um, hi, I'll like ask a question. Uh, Jason, what do you think uh, could be done for the youth of St. Lucie? <laughs> done in terms of what? You know, in, in terms of sport? In terms of basically uplifting in the whole. I, I, I wouldn't just try to say great down to people of St. Lucie, but I think as a, as a, as a people here in, in, in Barbados, I just think... We just need to understand again where we want to go. You know, we need to understand where we want to go, and you know, set the course of action as to how you're going to get there. Um, again, we get, we get so consumed with results that we we lose sight of the actual small things in front of us. You know, and sometimes we just need to narrow in a little bit more in the process, and sometimes forget about the end result. But I just believe in having that direction. You know, you need to understand where you want to go, and just try to plot that way forward. One more question. Um, you know where the um, where the community around our stars name? No, I I, I honestly don't Thanks. know. <laughs> Any more? Yes, these lights are really blinding. My question is: There are children at my school who want to take part in different sports and activities, and their parents cannot. They don't have the money to afford to buy the gear and stuff. When the children, they are afraid to, you know, go out there and participate because they think the other children will, you know, tease them and make fun of them because they don't have the gear. What would you say to them? Again, you you got to keep your head down. Um, I remember when I started playing cricket. At school, for instance, there were a number of schools who couldn't afford gear, you know, a number of players who didn't have that, that, that equipment. But we, we would obviously lend gear um, when we see fit. You know, I saw many times where guys played cricket with one pad. And it was also a lesson learned because you didn't want to get hit on the foot that I didn't have the pad on. <laughs> so for me, it's a blessing and a curse. You know, I just think about, think, think that we need to use the resources that we have. We're not blessed sometimes to have the, well, every single 
resource available to us, but I think we've got enough that we could make do. And I just think in time as, you know, we grow as a country, and uh, the schools, for instance, can, can get that financing to, to help uplift sport uh, and buy the equipment, then we can, we can obviously be, be heading in that direction. But I t think until now, you know, we go back to sharing a little bit more. It gets, it, it gets you to, to understand individuals a, a little bit better as well, too, because I guess pride comes in the way you come into, come and go into someone and asking them to, to, to use the, their equipment. So, again, that's a, a, a way to communicate with, with, a, with a peer, and you just build our relationship with them. You know, you have an understanding. Well, look, today is Tuesday. We have practice on Tuesday. I may, leave, I may not have... You know, my back today, uh, we couldn't travel with it on the, on the bus, for instance. Um, that was a challenge for us, you know, getting on the bus with, with cricket gear. So I'm going to leave my gear home, and my partner may, may be coming down, and, you know, he may be getting a lift down with his parents. So I'll just use your gear today and vice versa. So I just think we just need to find ways to, to make do with what we have. And, you know, again, once you have your, your, your head down as to where you want to go, then I don't think the distraction should come in the way of, you know, you feeling uncomfortable not having, you know, the equipment there, um, but I think you just need to put your head down, you know, focus a little bit more on, on what you want to achieve and forget some of the noise and, and the peripherals. Well said. Okay. Jason, thank you very much. And, um, thank you. <laughs> and um, I'm going to continue to ask you to be engaged in case we need you throughout. But I'd like to invite Puffy. Andre? Um, before Andre comes to the stage, um, we have a question from, the social, from social media. And the question is for the PM, how do you achieve work-life balance as a world leader? <laughs> I, I can't even tell you that I'm achieving balance now. <laughs> but I try. Um, when Puffy comes on stage, he, he will tell you, you know what I would like to do more than anything else between now and August? Guess. I'd like to learn to DJ. <laughs> uh, anybody who knows me knows my absolute love for music. So that my work-life balance comes by being able to spend time either listening to music and very occasionally if I can get to swim. Because when you're in the ocean... You really don't have no phone or anybody <laughs> coming at you. And I find that your blood pressure just comes right down. Your whole mental state is different. So that, quite frankly, being able to do that a few times a month and being able to listen to music at least twice a week is sufficient for me to be able to feel refreshed to meet the next day. But with those words, the master of DJing, are you going to help teach me how to DJ? <laughs> one one quick thing, mic? sorry, one quick thing before we get right into the conversation. MX169, your car light is on. I thought that would have been my job. <laughs> and that's normally me. But, um, Prime Minister, I will give you some good news and say, you know, um, last year was definitely the year of milestones. And I reached a milestone last year, which I actually, um, I actually found myself feeling very fulfilled afterward, and I will be a little more vulnerable than usual because um, I, um, speaking on mental health, I actually went to my first uh, counseling session today. So that was a big milestone for me, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, but to, to, to give you some, um, some good news, I actually um, completed or, or gave my first uh, workshop uh, when it came to DJing, uh, partnering with Red Bull 3 Style and a, an academy in Singapore called Ace Academy. And um, it, it went pretty well. So I guess you would be our featured guest at the <laughs> workshop here in Barbados. <laughs> I look forward to that. Yes. Um, I want to start off by saluting your courage. You know, a lot of my candidates, when I first started meeting with them, I would tell them, that in this game of public life, if you want to be sincere, you have to risk yourself. Because if you're not risking yourself, people will get on that you're really not being sincere or truthful in what you're saying. And with your sharing about the counseling session just now, 
is a tremendous statement of 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 vulnerability on your part but also it gives confidence to others who may be thinking how do i talk how do i share how do i ask for help 100% and i'd like you to speak a little more about that for me please i i feel like the general the general mindset or picture that people have when it comes to going to a therapist or going to a counselor is that you know something major has to be wrong and that's not always the case you know i found today and i mean this is coming from a really organic place after i basically told um the dots what was going on and how i was feeling in my life obviously i'm stressed uh, as a result of work you know my personal life does have its battles that i fight but um after that before even being provided with a solution just being able to talk it out to somebody who doesn't have a bias or doesn't have a a premeditated or or perception or or understanding of myself you know that that was an amazing feeling it literally like it literally felt as though somebody lifted the weight of the world off of my shoulder you know and that was before even being provided with a solution you know or or things or steps that might help me toward overcoming my little hurdles that i might be dealing with you know so i think we just need to eradicate that taboo that something has to be seriously wrong or you have to be feeling or going through something serious you know um in order to go see somebody or in order to go have a conversation about yourself you know uh, and that's why just now i was saying to jason the in opportunities for intergenerational interaction 100% are so important because not everybody may have the luxury of being able to go to a counselor yeah but there may be somebody in the community that they can speak with that can begin to help them and as you said even just the t- the task of speaking yeah is a liberating factor for most mm-hmm. people mm-hmm. um I have a funny way of putting it. I tell people I don't leave out the space in my head. And I say so because you determine what you concentrate on in here. 100%. You know, and this is part and parcel of what we have to do. Now you've been able to travel the world. What difference has it made to you being able to be given that opportunity as opposed to if you were in Barbados and not being able to see other places or go other places or meet other people i feel like that exposure gives you a priceless uh level of or or a priceless development of open mindedness you know what i mean and i feel like in our societies that is lacking a bit because we tend to think that you know this 166 square miles that we live on is the end all and be all but really and truly it is not <laughs> you know um being exposed to so many different cultures different people doing different things uh tackling tasks and exposing and uh expressing themselves in different ways uh that is something that you cannot pay money for you know what i mean a price cannot be put on that and um that level of open mindedness that that has provided for me is is something that i use each and every day and and it, it helps me to not only deal with people but in my profession and how I DJ and how I present music and how I read crowds and audiences because you know that that is that is critical that is critical in my career especially I, I, and even down to what food you eat 100% because <laughs> i think that one of the things that struck me was talking to a he is in so young a, a middle aged man the other day who said to me i said you want a, a goat roti he said i don't eat goat i said why he said I don't I, uh, <laughs> i never i never had it before and i ain't trying it so that that sense of openness is something do you value it now 100% i do and, and do you believe that the society that we live in can be made stronger by making people more open and more willing to try different things from from different foods 
to being able to speak and relate to different people, Surely. to people from different religions talking to each other. I want to hear you on those things. Yeah, I mean, if it's, if it's one thing that I really do love is that in itself, you know what I mean? Um, sometimes, um, and I could touch on, on some of the things that you touched on just now, uh, I have a habit of whenever I go to a country or I'm exposed to a new culture, I ask them, yo, so what's the local food? What do you guys eat here? Uh, sometimes it's amazing. Sometimes I pay the price. Um, <laughs> well, they you, said nothing ventured, nothing gained. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, um, you know, but that that in itself is is something great because that can lead that one experience can lead to uh, something as um, interesting as a conversation starter. You know what I mean? You might be somewhere and you're talking to somebody from a different culture, but you have that one thing in common where it was this, it was this particular food that you tried and you all share the experience and that conversation turns into a relationship or a business relationship that you all might, you know, learn to cultivate. So um, I definitely get my hands wet uh, in, in many, many areas. Food <laughs> is one of them. Activities is another. Um, touring with Red Bull, you cannot go to somebody's country and not do a local activity or not be exposed to um, their, their local music and uh, uh, a sport or something that they might, you know, hold valuable. So that's definitely something that I do all the time and it's definitely molded me into the person that I am today. What do you think we need to do to be able to cause more of our young people to appreciate that? there is a virtue in being open to other people and other cultures. What do I think I need to do? What do we need to do to make them more open, to foster that openness? I feel like there's so many tools that they already use. As you said earlier, you can seek what you want to seek and find what you want to find. YouTube is something that I use every single day. Um, and I, furthermore, I don't even watch TV. <laughs> I don't even have cable. You know, I watch YouTube and I find what I want to find. And I search for what I want to search for. But I do have a period in time where I just dive into the unknown. And um, I feel like we could utilize things like YouTube and just be like, yo, uh, have community sessions where... You know, we decide, we pick a topic and we start to watch videos on it and have a, com uh, have a conversation when it comes to that. Um, Jason did say something about um, the community center. Uh, I feel like, and I was talking to Matthew about it, uh, this was an idea of mine and I wanted to talk to you and Jonathan about it before, um, but our schedules just never matched. I feel like um, something that will help our society and our, our um, not only just the people in our society, but our entrepreneurs as well, is to have uh, co-op spaces, you know? Um, looking at play, uh, people like, for instance, my photographer, he, um, he might not be completely comfortable with doing work at home, but if we have a space where these people could come and sit down and have somewhere comfortable to work, AC, internet, a printer, nibble, uh, little things to nibble on, you know what I mean? These spaces could start conversations among people who might never even have met up if they stuck in their little corner. You know what I mean? So community centers or co-op spaces, I think that that's, that would be something that would be interested to implement uh, going on to the future. You, you know what I mean? Good news now or later? <laughs> uh, well, well, one of the things that had me consume this afternoon was with, in the middle of doing estimates. Okay. with different ministries and met with the Ministry of Industry and International Business this afternoon. And what we're trying to do is separate from the community development centers to create some spaces that we put in a green screen and one or two. We put in some computers. We put in some labs. Basically, innovation spaces. Correct. And the first one will be in the harbor um, because it's in town and mm -hmm. central for people to go there. But ultimately, we want to be able to have locations across the island that are doing the same thing. So something may be in Spikestown, something may be in um, Belle Plain, something may be in um, Six Roads, in the Glebe. Um, 
And as close as Spike Stone may be to here, I'm sure Peter's going to tell me that he wants to do something in St. Lucie. But it needs to be a, <laughs> it needs to be a public-private effort. Right. And I get it, because in some instances, for whatever reason, the home may not be ideal for a particular person to operate. Correct. And then they may want the synergy or the space where they can bounce ideas right. off of other people. So I thank you for raising it, and certainly will follow through on it. Yeah, um, my three words to say to you um, upon hearing that is call me in. <laughs> and anytime you need me, just holler because yeah, yeah. I would love to be. I can holler. You know, I would love to be um, associated with that. You know yeah. what I mean? Anytime. Yeah, and I think giving people access to a green screen mm -hmm. gives them so many different other opportunities because as I keep saying, I don't know where the next Puffy coming from, the next Jason Holder, the next Cigarfield Sobers, the next Rihanna the next Aquila. I don't know where they're coming from. So we have to be able to foster the environment to allow them to blossom and to be able to come up to the top. Yeah. Um, apart from that, though, how difficult is it for you to be on the road all the time? Oh, well, I mean, I am... You know, you, you know <laughs> Buju has a song. If you were in front of the thing, no, I would tell you, bring it up. Um, <laughs> But it's it's not an easy road. It is, it is not Demo an easy road. Demo see the glamour and the glitter think a better rose. Correct. Who feels it knows. <laughs> yes, um, I am actually um, uh, mid-vacation, mid-break. Matthew actually begged me uh, to come out and come off and plug out, you know. Um, so this is... Thank you. This is the first time that I'm actually doing it. Uh, I'm a couple of days in and I'm liking it more than I should. <laughs> I've been playing PlayStation every day. Uh, but yeah, um, it's, uh, it, it's not an easy road, you know. Um, something that I was actually having a conversation about uh, with a good friend of mine is um, social media is like the matrix, you know. And um, we, only, we tend to only share our wins on, on socials, you know. And... Um, People are programmed by that, and they think that the lives that we live is only glitz and glamour and hype and enjoyment. But really and truly, it is definitely difficult. They don't see the countless hours of jet lag that myself and Jason would uh, be dealing with. Uh, they don't see the fact that um, no matter what you're going through or no matter how tired you are, you still have to put on that face and put on those pads or, you know, put your mind in a gear. Or I'll share one with you. I left here Friday night, traveled 23 hours, was in a place for 44 hours, and then traveled another 23 hours last night to Correct. get back here. And be told and that that takes. And then went straight into a meeting, and then straight to give a speech, and then another meeting after that, then to prepare for estimates for today. The toll that that takes mentally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got to put on that face. And sometimes it is harder than... Other times, but just suck it in. Correct. Suck it up. You got to do what continue. you got to do. Yeah. And and that is the message. You see, social media has its benefits, but it has its disadvantages. Indeed. And how are you therefore, having said that, it has shown too much only of the positive. What do you believe that we need to start doing in Barbados to start to allow those who watch us on social media? to have a more realistic understanding of what life really is? Uh, I think that, first of all, what helped me particularly was to seek knowledge and to raise my level of self-awareness. You know, um, as I became more self-aware, I'm more aware of how I was feeling, how present I am in the now, stuff like that, that allowed me to kind of understand what was happening and... and really show people, okay, cool, well, this is, what's, this is where I need to go and this is where we need to be. Um, what should we do to, to help folks to, to get out there? Um, I feel like communication is a big deal. Um, start those conversations. Uh, we definitely, um, we come from a place where speaking out on certain things is you know, kind of taboo as well. Um, a lot of people don't know how to swallow their pride um, but failing forward is something that we need to learn to do. Uh, I take pride in failing forward. 
and I might not share my failures all the time, but I definitely do it, you know. I thank you for that courage. There's some youngsters, I think, here who want to ask some questions. Where are they? Yeah, good night. Good night. Good night, sir. Um, take a deep breath and try to choose my words correctly. No problem. You, you. Just shoot any way you want to put it, bro. Right. Um, do we gather anything that going on? I, I like it. And we had a little tournament the other day in Chacal, football. Most of St. Lucie is football. Um, earlier, Holder was talking about the cricket, and I remember going to school. We um, attend a first class game in Crab Hill. That was good. So as you were saying earlier, in terms of fixing the fields, we just got to go all the way AstroTurf to play football. UWA wants, wants to play UWA. And we would like to feel somewhere in the north, rather than we going to the south town, whatever you want to call it, to play football. I hear you. Um, well, I, I thank yeah, you for raising I, I hear you. I'm actually talking, in fairness, to the Brewster's Trust about working with government to see how we can upgrade a number of fields across the island. So I, I know it's a real problem and we're going to deal with it. So it's just a question of which ones we choose to deal with first in St. Lucie. But ultimately our goal really must be one to upgrade. But I want you to do a little partnership with me now too. Because once we do the heavy lifting and the heavy upgrading, in some instances communities may need to help us take care of it too. Are you all up for that? Yeah, um, and all, well, I just do coaching in work right in Chaka Hall, and it's be very difficult as the 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 little um the 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 girl come early and she said um in terms of equipment and stuff, it's be very difficult because parents don't have in order to send their children, and then some children being that they don't have don't want to go there and showcase their skill, but they be talented. So in terms of raising funds and finding the money, or if the government because like the little programs done got right now. And then got the young coaches going out there and doing the little coaching. If we could get more of that going on, not you just like now. that program? I love it. Okay. No and problem. I know other people here love it because then they got them things going, they needing things in St. Lucie. When I come here tonight, I was expecting more St. Lucie, being real. Mm -hmm. I, like Puffy, went on YouTube, see the work he could do. Um, Jason Holder, love him, cricket coach. I was not saying Puffy shouldn't be there, Sir Frack. That's me being real. Good point. Uh, Kimar Roach. Good point. Kimar Roach, right there from uh, Lowland St. Lucie. Mm. West Indies cricketer, same mm. way. Mm. So, not that they don't like Puffy, not that they don't like Jason Holder, St. Mm. Lucie, we mm. gathering what I expected. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. But, but I think you're doing a wonderful job. Yeah, because I. I, I, I <laughs> I was, I just come and I, I being real, I being honest, I was at work, I went with my girlfriend to get some lunch, I said, well, they got to be gathering thing, I could come down here, I could get a belly full, I got right there, tell myself there's some rotis across there, going across there, something I can't remember, chicken, something that I don't even like, I appreciate it, something was given, somebody in St. Lucie could prepare that, we would have feel a lot better, people here, and I know like, <laughs> we gathering in St. Lucie, Give me more St. Lucy. We got a lot of things that we want, we need, and know that I see. And again, a lot of claps and things. I think that people know we're coming. Actually, see what they want to see. I hope, I hope so too. I think we just found the mayor of St. Lucy. Thank you, my star. Um, you didn't give me a name, though. Huh? Right. My name is King Mark Goddard. King Mark Goddard. Everybody know me as Crab. Crab. That's <laughs> please. <laughs> All right, my brother. Thank you very much. Who's next? Over here? Yes, good night. Now, I could attest to what King Mark is saying because I'm a painter by trade. Mm. And after I found and researched a lot of information regarding to the culinary arts and being that Barbados is supposed to be the capital of the culinary arts, I set out on a journey about three years ago documenting the various places around Barbados where people can go and get something to eat. 
So that visual catalog, I have that on YouTube. It's called Lunch Lime. And my objective was to go majority, if all of the places, to give people a first person view of what they can expect from countries far and wide when they get here and they will see for themselves what the experience is through the eyes of two Barbadians. This is myself and my co-host. What's your name? My name is Dexter Johnson. Thank you, Dexter. Uh, thank right. you thank you for doing that kind of program that others can find. It says lunch lame? Yes, it is. Thank you. Lame or lame? Lame. L-I-M-E. That's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Because, I mean, personally, if we do brag about Barbados being the culinary capital, and I'm a painter by trade, I paint houses, I pressure wash. And if I can do that, if I can set out to create that goal, that vision that I had, to you know, give people that idea that we can step out from what we normally do and embark on other ideas that we have, that we dreamed on, and we could come together with a great team, myself and you know, my, my team, to make that happen. I think that's something that other youngsters on the island that do have those dreams could embark on. I mean, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a struggle, like what Puffy said, it's, it's been a struggle um, I've been turned on many times. I've been turned on from sponsorship, you know, the whole full works. But I've never stopped because I, I believe that ultimately my aim is to make that inf information that I put out in flight information. That when people come to the island and they're seeing this information on the plane coming, to, coming here, they could see, well, this is what is going on from the eyes of a Bajan. Not a polished show, not a scripted show, just two people sitting down, enjoying the food taking snapshots of food, telling people what the food is about before they get here. And that is my goal. Well, and the truth is that more and more tourists are interested in the experiences that are unvarnished. So I salute you and want to encourage you to continue doing it. More Thanks. importantly, I am impressed by the fact that you're doing this as a hobby and that your first job is really the painting and the power washing. So. I can say to you that prepare for some work. I think you're going to see a construction boom in Barbados soon. <laughs> I so. appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes? Hi, I'm going to um, puff you a question. What do you think can be done to help young DJs um, who have an interest in getting on the world stage like you are right now? What do you think can be done to help them uplift themselves or do their craft better? I think a lot can be done. Um, and as I announced at the beginning of our little talk, um, I will be working closely with some friends of mine uh, on starting or implementing workshops, uh, DJ workshops here in Barbados. Um, we have to teach the Prime Minister how to DJ. So <laughs> that is something that um, we're definitely going to be putting our foot toward uh, this year. Um, so. That is it. We're going to be doing the workshops and hopefully we can expose uh, young DJs or not only young DJs, but people who want to get into the craft, myself, Just Jay. Uh, we could all ask Surf Rat for a helping hand to step in and um, get everybody involved and uplift and really develop our industry. Because uh, I will say this, if you could DJ in Barbados, you could DJ anywhere in the world. We are some of the most difficult people to please. And so far, here so is... You ever, you ever see Bajans at a, at a concert? Let me tell you. They stand up and watch. <laughs> so all, all I will ask you to do is just keep your ears to the ground. Um, what you can do right now is if you have a question, reach out to one of us. Did you try? Did you try? Are you a DJ yourself? No. No? Do you have any friends who are DJs? Yeah. Yeah? Did any of them try to reach out to me or, or send me a message on Instagram or anything? I guess so. Pardon? I, 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 I don't know for sure, but I guess yeah. they try to contact me. Well, I mean, sometimes, you know, we just need to build the courage to, to reach out. You know what I mean? We are as easy. It is as easy as sending a direct message sometimes. You know what I mean? But, but what if they're not in your circle or any of your peer circle? You have Instagram, you have Twitter, and I use those a lot. 
I, I asked that because you said you were starting a workshop. And yes. Your mom, your soul was wondering how someone as not connected to you or your peers could get involved in that workshop. Being someone from the north, where let me say transportation is an issue or other things are issues, how can they get involved in that workshop? Uh, just off the top of my head, I feel a, a solution to that would just be, as I said, uh, reach out to the, the the local people in the community. So, for instance, you guys, St. Lucia, you, St. Lucie, you have um, sorry, making the same, making the same mistake that Jason made. The breeze definitely feels like Lucia. But um, yeah, sorry, uh, St. Lucy, you all have people that you are directly connected to. Surf Rat, um, Sheldon Pop, Level Vibes, you know, they're also from here. Um, so we would definitely be asking their assistance and, and reaching out to people that they may know or just spreading the word and um, working, you know, you could bum a lift with one of them. I don't mind putting a, a couple people in my car and driving them down the road, you know what I mean? So. I am perfectly fine with that. So we'll definitely be, um, our ears, our, our hands will be down on the ground and we'll be working with the people who are directly connected to you guys as well uh, in getting everybody involved. Okay, thanks. Is that cool? Thanks. It's okay. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hi, good night, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Nume. Uh, Puffy, thanks for sharing um, about the counseling, your vulnerability, um, because that is an act of courage and it also gives per other people permission to, you know, seek that kind of assistance without feeling judged. So thank you for sharing that. That was a highlight for me. Thanks. Um, with regards to the um, gentleman that talked about uh, highlighting food in Barbados, that's a topic that's very dear to my heart. Um, we do have some incredible food in Barbados, and as we all know, there is, we are in a very dire state with the state of the health of the nation. And my concern is um, the school meals um, that are be currently being prepared for the children. And it's one thing... Um, as a physician or just as someone who's very passionate about food and nutrition to educate people um, about nutrition and you know how to cook and how to do all of the things. But then there's also um, the challenges of um, accessibility. So yes, knowledge is one thing, but there's accessibility. So how can we make- the Affordability. Uh, yes, uh, and affordability um, as well. And the when, when I try to um, discuss with my patients about um, maybe choosing healthier options, the affordability always comes up. And I try to remind um, people that I find that affordability is a challenge when you're actually trying to purchase healthy food that's already prepared. So say, for example, you want to buy a salad from um, somewhere. It's usually more expensive than if you, if you go to a fast food place. But the other alternative actually is to, um, you have to have more effort, put in more effort and go to places like the markets and support the small farmers where you can buy local ground provisions and, and, and the food that is grown and produced here in Barbados and put the effort to, to create those meals at home and it would be cheaper, right? So, um, but my, my, as I said, my concern mainly right now um, is the school meals for children and what is being given to them. So how is it, how can we provide healthier meals for the children because so that access, accessibility wouldn't be a problem. Um, and also in that way, if we can, we can provide healthier meals because the things that people think are unhealthy are things, um, people, sorry, the things that people deem to be not delicious are actually healthy, right? So healthy meals are delicious. So if we go and we get our sweet potatoes and cassavas and eddos and, and, and cook those things and provide them at school, the children will enjoy them. We just have to educate them about it and um, prime their taste buds to it. And in that way, providing those foods for the children is also supporting our local farmers and our local, eco our local economy. I think you must have heard me this morning in estimates. I met with the Ministry of Agriculture and Food Security, and one of the things we made clear, in fact, they're coming back Saturday with new production targets for both ground provisions and vegetables, mm -hmm. because I am adamant that we need to reduce the import bill on a lot of the things that we are importing that we can produce locally. Yes. So that, <laughs> in, in almost every instance, our production in 
food crops in 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 ground provisions is lower than it was in 2005 lower than it was in 2003 lower than it was in 2001 whether it's cassava or yams or okras or string beans i can go down the line and i said to them to come back to me because we need now i am going to support things where i see a settled plan for production so that tell me what are the targets how are we going to get there? Who are the farmers that are going to help us get there? What are six-week crops? What are 12-week crops? What are six-month crops? Mm -hmm. And let us work it systematically down the line in order to make a difference. Equally, we then raised with the Ministry of Industry this afternoon the fact that some people, for example, <laughs> and I laughed and joked, those of you who may leave here late tonight and want to stop at the supermarket may not want to pick up a sweet potato that you got to go and peel. Mm -hmm. But if you get some prepared sliced sweet potato in the supermarket, as you do with other vegetables or whatever now, that there has to be some level of value-added or agro-processing that will allow us to be able to cater to all needs in the society. Mm -hmm. Now, thirdly, and... I'll say it to you this way, as Minister of Education, when I tried to change the school meals menu, the children just would not eat it in town. In the country, no, I ain't joking, in the country we got through with it. So we introduced a lot more ground provisions in town, they just didn't eat it. Perhaps I have a different perspective now, because with older age, I will say to the others, you've got to stay the course with it, and eventually they will eat it. Because the truth is that if I could ban macaroni pie from being eaten every day, I would do it. Because really and truly, people should eat macaroni pie once or twice a month, if so much. Because it is a walking heart attack. And it bothers me, Jason, when I see sportsmen telling me, when I ask them what you want to eat, they say pie. <laughs> and I'm saying to myself, where are you going to get the stamina from? If you eat in pie, <laughs> okay? So it is a public education process, but I also believe puffy people like you. What vegetables do you like? Uh, I eat a lot of carrots. I love carrots. Broccoli mm -hmm. is another thing that I like a lot. Um, what about squash? Squash is decent. Exactly. <laughs> squash is decent still. But, but, but you know why I ask these questions? Because even today with like the Ministry okras. of Agriculture, I, I learned to love okras only in the last year. I no, I love best. okras, I love okras. But only today, I asked the Ministry of Agriculture, we are importing five, six million dollars a year in broccoli. Are you going to grow it? Or are you going to get people to start eating something? Because when I was a child, we used to eat a lot more string beans. We used to eat a lot more. I don't know the last time I see string beans about the place. Huh? You understand? So that how do we get eating habits across the board back to match local agricultural production? And at the end of the day, I think that people like yourself and Jason and others have the ability to influence youngsters too. The last point I want to make on this is this. Whenever I go into a community and I meet a young teenager who has promised cricket, football, athletics, whatever it is, I immediately call the people around him and say, you know you're dealing with precious commodity. And it is up to you to make sure that this young boy or this young lady stays the course and eats properly. No big set of drinking or no smoking or nothing so. And study yourself. You think if people didn't take care of you, say bolt, and make sure that he was on the straight and narrow in terms of how he ate, and not drinking and not smoking, do you think he would have achieved what he did? Mm. Obadele, you're here, same thing, and you'll get your chance to speak soon. But those things, okay? And I find that in communities, we need to take the talent and the youngsters among us and nurture them, because sometimes they feel left out. Oh, other people drinking, or other people getting to do this, or other people getting to do that, and I can't get to do it. And at the end of the day, you're dealing with young people who are still trying to fight the test of maturity, who are still trying to, to grow and whose brain is still thinking and manipulating all these things. 
But I do feel that there's a role for people like yourselves because we have a crisis and it's called chronic NCDs. Years ago, it was HIV and AIDS that was the sole focus. The truth is when we look at the incidence of diabetes, when we look at the incidence of hypertension, when we look at the incidence of stroke, when we look even at the people who are now presenting with kidney disease, and, and, and we may have to have the conversation as we started to up to yesterday about transplants because just to do dialysis, dialysis is three times as expensive as a transplant. But transplant can't only be about living donors. We're going to have to look at people also. And I say it publicly now, if something happens to me, I want all of my organs to be given to whoever needs them to live a better life. Because at the end of the day... At the end of the day, if we can help others live stronger and better lives, why not do it? So these are some of the conversations that as a nation, not as a government, government's role is different, but as a nation, these are some of the conversations we need to be having in terms of changing how we eat, changing how we do certain things. The government is prepared to put, we're going to put, I think, a minimum of 30, it might be 40, I can't remember now, community nursing aides across the country dealing with those patients who have become the most chronic ones that the hospital is already dealing with. This has nothing to do with the primary health care system. And we're going to put those 30 nurses or so dealing hopefully with about 50, 60 patients each over a two-week period. We're going to have three doctors working above them. And then we want to start also some community exercise programs so that in St. Lucie, in St. Peter, in St. Joseph, people don't necessarily have to come to town or go to a gym in some instances, but it's being done to just get older people moving and to keep them moving or even people who are not working but don't have the money to be able to pay to go to a gym. Okay? Um, I honor your efforts. Uh, the school meals will keep going a second time again. Yes, and I honor your efforts to um, provide that for the community. Um, I just have another concern is that, um, like we said, accessibility. When everyone leaves here, they don't want to go to Massey or to the supermarket and, you know, go home and cook. So a main problem is accessibility. And a huge concern of mine is now the development of these large American franchises that are being introduced into the country and making a very low quality food um, easily accessible to the average working class and we see our um, we see the locals now um, reaching out for that food on a daily basis and the fact of the matter is that accessibility the accessibility to these types of foods will result in um, more NCDs and it is affecting their productivity that's why I'm saying mm -hmm. that we have to be able to boost production but at the same time, increase public education by people who are influencers being able to explain to people, look, boy, left out, left out, left out that piece of macaroni pie. Leave out that piece of that, that roti there. Eat this instead. But if it is available because people are planting more in communities and parishes, the sweet potatoes, the edders, the breadfruit, all of those things then are there for people to access and to be able to afford. But when I asked him, you talk about broccoli. Broccoli is always going to be more expensive than string beans grown locally. Not true? Yes, and Burger King is very cheap. That so is true. But this is, whether, so this whether is them my, this or is any other fast food, the reality is you can't ban them, but you have to be able to sensitize people that everything with moderation so that you can't be eating fast food every day and that you need to be able to balance it. And how many people talk to people about what their plate should look like and what nutrients they should get? How many people talk to people about why there needs to be balance? And those are the well, things... Well, I, I do. No, um, I, don't mean, I don't mean you <laughs> personally. I, I, I understand. Clearly you do. I understand. But I'm saying that those are some of the conversations that I'm having both within the ministries and within civil society. Because unless we raise a people, we cannot build a nation. And we take a lot for granted that people know what is good for them and what is not. 
And when you start to talk with people, you realize that people genuinely don't know. So that I'm out telling boy, I ain't eating no more meat. Without realizing that they need to substitute and put some other kind of thing in there to be able to build the proteins. And that proteins are necessary. So I just think that these conversations don't only have to happen at my level. But I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to have people recognize that community by community by community, we can start the conversations, we can start the mentorship. These 650 families that I want us to hold their hands, part and parcel of the process is not only about that, but it's just about getting them to understand you can't cook macaroni every day. If you cook macaroni or pasta every day and you're not eating no kind of vegetables at all, you're going to end up with problems. And that's why more and more young people are presenting with type 2 diabetes. Not true? Yeah, of course. So we have a national crisis. But I thank you for raising it. Puffy, I don't know if you want to add your two cents worth to it, please. Um, well, uh, I would definitely help in raising the awareness uh, when it comes to eating healthy. I do try to eat as healthy as possible. Uh, sometimes coming home at the wee hours in the morning is not always great options. I will admit that. Um, but if I can hold out until the morning, I will definitely try to do so. And sometimes it's not even necessary to eat that late. You know, it just uh, falls into habit or, or some beliefs that we might have. So, you know, sometimes you just need to stick it out. Sometimes uh, something as simple as a glass of water could be that substitute for that late night craving for me. You know, so that's just my personal experience. Uh, if that could help some, somebody watching this. Later think, on. Yeah, I think we just need to share more and more. Absolutely. Um, Roshana? So, Prime Minister, at this moment, I just want to invite um, Mr. John Jones. Um, he's done very well um, in agricultural field, and I think that at this point in time, he can provide a very, very good insight as it relates to NCDs and eating healthier um, for Barbadians. Thank you. Hey, good night, everyone. Good night. Uh, just to touch on what the nurse said, um, I do, doctor, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, healthy food is actually accessible in Barbados. Um, we as a people are just kind of lazy. I would say that, yeah. Today alone, I, at our farm, we harvested over 10,000 pounds of sweet potato. I mean, it's available, it's there. Um, I am assistant manager at um, Redland Farms in St. George. You probably see our lettuce brand in the supermarket. Um, I am in, also in charge of uh, helping sales, help boost sales at, at uh, the farm. I studied at Illinois State University in the States. Um, and I played professional basketball for five years and traveled all around the world. And during my time playing basketball, I actually took advantage of every single op agricultural opportunity in each country that I lived. Uh, Australia was the last where uh, I helped on a 25-acre farm that probably produced enough food to feed everybody in Barbados. Um, I think, uh, Prime Minister, we actually need to focus on five to ten years from now, how can we feed everybody? How can we modernize agriculture? Because agriculture is seen as an old-time thing and it's not seen as something that you can actually become wealthy from. Um, it's, you need to approach the farmers themselves, they need to be educated about how to grow stuff, how to go through the fertilizer process, how to actually plant, how to understand the science behind all of this stuff. You probably heard this from the minister. No, I, I am only laughing because I didn't hear it from him. I told him that today. Where's Mr. Roy Morris? Because one of the things that we've indicated is that within the next month, the Ministry of Agriculture has a certain number of extension officers, but those extension officers can multiply their benefit if they start to put in the HOTA program that I talked about at the beginning, how to grow X, how to grow Y, how to grow sweet potato, how to grow yes, where indeed. to put it. And it's that kind of information that needs to be publicly available so that more people in the communities we were dealing with the issue of accessibility just now of vegetables and fruit so that more people can be engaged in growing their own. And yes. one of the things, yes, we've set out to plant trees this year, but some of the trees that we plant, 
must be food bearing trees, fruit bearing trees as well. Yes, I can actually help you um, in, um, with your broccoli to lower the import bill. Four Square Farms just started a small operation in growing broccoli. You could probably help invest in, in them maybe, and they could help you in turn mass produce broccoli to um, lower our import bill on that. We'd love that. Yes. I would have loved that as well. Yeah, and they're... <laughs> He's There's, not like George Bush. <laughs> yeah, modernizing is also a main focus that you could focus on because as we upskill in, um, in our society, we also need to produce more food faster and produce more food more efficiently. Um, there are greenhouse farms that I've toured that fully automated. You don't have to have anyone working there. And the containers too. Yeah, con containers will work, but um, I'm a little biased against them. Mm -hmm. And uh, they don't produce that much food. They produce qu quality, but not quantity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think we could have a conversation. I would actually love to be there when you're speaking to the uh, Ministry of Agriculture. Come back. At, come with me on Saturday at 10 o'clock. No problem. I'll be there early. Be with them good. Again, I, I want to also make the point that if we're going to do this, and look, I've chosen agriculture and health because I believe that they have been the outside children of the government of Barbados for the last 50 years. And I mean that not in a disparaging way, but I believe that we need to be able to get on top of both of them if we're going to see a platform laid to be able to stop the undermining of our society um, by literally undermining the ability of people to work and to live longer. Um, but I also want us to be conscious that we have something called the CARICOM single market and single economy. And therefore, we're not only limited by what lands are available in Barbados, but Suriname... Um, Senator Wiggins is here, and she is my special envoy to Suriname. And she can tell you that, for example, we are now in the process of about to, I think, Opportunity Knocks or Calls, was JS program has run it, but we need some additional ads because we need to find 25 or 30 people who are interested in going to Suriname to engage in farming as a pilot project. And if this works, then the sky is the limit. Because the truth is that Suriname has a need for people. It is the size of the Netherlands, but it only has a population of 600,000 roughly when the Netherlands has 17 million people. Suriname has one of the largest sources of fresh water. It has the Brokopondo Lake that is almost four times the size of Barbados at about 600 square miles. Now, they are more than prepared to work with Barbadians to develop greater opportunity in agriculture and in food farming and in fishing. And I am interested in finding out who are the people in Barbados that really have a passion for agriculture. And I've said to the Ministry of Agriculture, look, we have some funds um, that we can make available to be able to really help those farmers who are serious about expanding production let us work with them. Similarly, those who want to be able to expand their horizons because a country like Suriname will ultimately offer them opportunities that we can never offer because we just don't have the land space. Um, and who are those people that are prepared to take on those new frontiers, particularly younger people? And let us work with you because it is our job to be able to help position you in those places to create the opportunities. Thank you very much. Uh, one Thank more, you. One more question. I, I know um, it's been discussed over the last couple of uh, months or a year, uh, but the, um, the marijuana, medical marijuana, where are we with, um, with that and what's the future? What does the future hold? I, I guess for young, ambitious farmers like myself that would love to do it legally. Well... <laughs> I, I want to say that you can only do it legally. Yes, that's the only, that's the only way I will get involved. Um, I think the Minister of Agriculture has announced that the process of licensing will start very shortly. And obviously, in order to do it legally, you need to be licensed. Um, and we are going to be working with the farmers to see how best 
because at the end of the day, we don't want similarly to make the same mistake that was made with sugar or that was made with many other primary commodities across the developing world where we only produce the primary commodity. We need to look at the manufacturing process. We need to look at the tourism value added. And we need to be able to extract as much value as we can for the Barbadian population, yes. working either together or working with other investors from outside. Yes. Um, and at the end of the day, scientific research is critical. Barbados led the world in the 19th century in scientific research on cane. We led the world. How many people in here know where grapefruit came from? Barbados. In the 19th century, grapefruit was... Puffy looking at me like, if I am just like saying something strange. Grapefruit was the product of sweet orange and... Shaddock. Shaddock. How many of you have seen... When last you see Bajan cherries? Every day. We're busy eating the one seed cherry, but we don't see the Bajan cherries anymore. Yes. Aloes, the Latin name for aloes is what? Aloes Barbadiensis. Yeah. And then there's another one that you have across St. Lucie and the East Coast, the maple, the agave maple Barbadiensis. And then there's the black belly sheep. I am saying that there's a whole host of things that are indigenous to this country or that are thriving in this country, that are associated with this country. And we need to be able to do a better job at isolating those things because we have a natural competitive advantage and a credible story to tell. Yeah. Now, having said and discovered that the grapefruit comes from here, when last you see a grapefruit tree? This morning at the farm. <laughs> That's you. We have over a thousand trees. That's you. When last you see a grapefruit tree across Bajan's houses? Hardly ever see any. And that's the point I'm making. So that I've said to the Ministry of Agriculture, these are the things that we need to propagate. Every Bajan should be planting a grapefruit tree in the backyard for 2020. Just to begin to start that. Because it is from um, about here. Secondly, where's the doctor? It's good for you, no? Yes. Come and tell us about the grapefruit quickly before I put down the mic. The grapefruit is very good for you. You should plant say it. that, but tell them why. <laughs> Well, it's very nutritious. It's dense in nutrients. Um, and yes, it's also helpful for weight loss. It's an amazing liver detox. So plant one. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so you're going to help us be able to get the message out. Yeah, my last... And more importantly, yeah. there are a number of young Barbadians I'm meeting like yourself now who are interested in farming. I want a register of all of you, and I want my message to go out from tonight. If you are young and you are Barbadian and interested in farming in this country or in Suriname, let reach out to my office... And I'll ask Roy to put out a special email for this and to put it into the press because governments don't trade. Governments don't grow. It is people. And if we can find the people who have the passion, the hardest thing is to have the passion. Puffy is at the top of his game because he got a passion for it. Jason is at the top of his game because he got a passion for it. So we need to find those who have passion in agriculture and want to move to the next level. And send us the information. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, good night. Puffy, I feel like I got you hostage up here, but... That's all right. Don't mind. <laughs> Madam Prime Minister, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. And good I evening. said that for a reason. All right? The people in St. Lucie would understand. I am born from St. Lucie and under the age of 35. Therefore, I feel rather qualified to speak um, tonight. It's a pleasure to have the Prime Minister here in St. Lucie, and I think I want to support the statements of the good doctor and our agriculturists as well, because it's going to segue nicely into what I'm going to add, which is about education. So say very quickly, on, in terms of school meals, um, very ambitious project to get children to eat what they don't want to eat. What I would say is make it palatable to the children. Whatever it is you're going to prepare, make it palatable. I am an educator, some 10 years or so experience, so I, I know when the cuckoo gets thrown away but they say the cocoa beef stew. So 
if you're going to do that in school, means you need to make whatever you make possible. However, now that we're on the topic of education, I want to say make three quick points because I have to be in town for nine o'clock. And um, <laughs> I, I, I don't think so. <laughs> Call whoever you're going to see and tell them you'll be there for 9.30. <laughs> because I don't want to visit you in the police station, nor I don't want to hear about you on the 7 o'clock news. Yes, Madam Prime Minister. Um, the three points I want to make quickly, I'm going to make them in reverse order. Um, there's a lot of talk now about education and what we're going to do in terms of education in Barbados going forward. It's talking about middle schools and changing things and all that kind of a stuff. But we have an education system that has worked for us in Barbados in the past. So my question is, what are we doing differently now than we did in the past? Perhaps if we look back to what some of the things we did that worked then, we'd be able to get these things to work now without making any major changes. So my first thing is stigma. There's a stigma that has become attached to secondary schools in Barbados. And uh, that stigma has produced results or lack thereof from the students in the school because they, think as, they feel as though they can't produce. But every single school in Barbados, secondary schools produce a lawyer, a doctor. All may not have produced politicians as yet. Um, but it's not only that. We have our painters, we have our artisans, our mechanics, our nurses, everybody has a part to play in society. So the, if I had the opportunity to do it, and you may have the power to do so, Madam Prime Minister, a destigmatization program, letting the children in Barbados know that we have success stories from every secondary school in Barbados. Let them know it's not what, where you go to school, but what you do there. As a late colleague of mine would have said, your attitude and not your aptitude determines your altitude. So destigmatize the schools. That's my first point. And then point number two, back to basics. Can I, can I pause one at a time so that we just take them off? I, I, can let you, I know you won't go, but I also want to interact with you. Um, the bottom line is that I entirely agree with you about the destigmatizing, but that is not in and of itself going to be enough. But I want to say my director of finance and economic affairs went to Parkinson. The former chief of staff of the Barbados Defense Force went to Parkinson Secondary School. Hartley Henry and the, and, the, and the deputy principal of Mona University went to St. George Secondary School. I can go on and on and find David Eswick and Trevor Clark from Bartel BT, who was also our ambassador in Geneva, went to Princess Margaret. I can go on and on. But what we want to do goes beyond the destigmatization. What we want to do is to turn every school in Barbados into a school of excellence, a top school, because we have different things that people can excel in. And if we can make each school a center of excellence, and if we can ask children not to choose at 10 and 11, but to choose more at 14 or 13, then they will have a better opportunity to make the right choice and then to be exposed to those things that will lift them up. You ask what why is it that our system is not working for us? Because our, it's not that our system isn't working for us any differently. It's that our judgment is different. Before we lived in a Barbados that was happy that people could be educated to seventh standard and leave. That's not good enough anymore. Before we lived in a Barbados where people were malleable and being able to be put. The 1940s British educational reform was about educating an elite and then making the rest of the population manageable and herdable. Right. To my second point, and thank you for those, those um, um, comments and reply. For my second point, back to basics. You're making a very important point, but somewhere along the line of progress, of getting better, we've gotten worse. You now have more children leaving the primary school system in Barbados about the basics than ever before. And in my estimation, from what I've seen, the reason is an overemphasis on examination scores and results. That is not to say you cannot have an examination, but let the examination do what it is supposed to do, as opposed to making it, as you say, determining a Are you a in primary or secondary? Primary. primary. So therefore, you know about the criterion reference test, The criterion right? reference test. And you know that the reason why the criterion reference test was introduced was to be able to assess what a child knows and doesn't know. And you know that really and truly that it is not being used for years now in the proper way. And I've met with the Minister of Education 
because that test at seven and at nine is to help a teacher know what are the gaps and the deficiencies that they have to correct. But correct? Here, here in lazy problem not agree. Hold on, I am done yet. Secondly, <laughs> that information at seven and nine, along with the other information, when a child leaves primary and goes into secondary, what do they walk with besides the new school books and a new school bag? What do they carry from the primary school that tells their new teacher that this is the, these are the skills or the gaps that this child has and this is how you're going to need to be able to focus on their deficiencies or their strengths to move forward. You understand what I'm saying? I understand what you're saying perfectly. The problem is not the test and not the test is not working. The problem is you have a system now where the ministry has adopted some ideas on education where they don't believe in streaming. They believe in a mixed ability classroom, which has its advantages in certain systems. If you have the, the resources, it could be an extra person, teacher aid, that kind of stuff. The problem we have in our system is that we identify the problems. Even if you don't do the criteria for this and you do an end of term test. Go with me for a, a moment here. If a child has an average at six years old in infants B, below 40, it means that most of what they should have already known, they do not know. Agreed? I agreed. And that's why they need to correct it before we keep propelling but, them upwards without doing it. But under our current system where we don't stream the classroom, it is mixability. We put that child up into class one in a mixability classroom. And then we try to teach them I, concepts on top of concepts. I, not I, I don't think that the problem is as simple as streaming or, or, or mixability. I think that the issue is that we need to be satisfied that children are learning at their own rate and pace. And unless we do that, we are unfairing and putting the children at a disadvantage. That is why we changed the age at which people could take the common entrance. That is why we created schools like the Alma Paris. I am now being faced, and I've told the Ministry of Education this as, as well, that we need to be able to ensure that the system can accommodate all capacities again. But I don't want to get into a deep, deep discussion on education because you've got to get to town and you're not getting there for 9 o'clock. <laughs> I, I, I totally agree with what you said, but basically what I'm saying is... As but I give you the assurance that Santia will be leading a number of town hall meetings across the country on the state of education. So I trust that you will come out and help share your views on it too. S certainly. And I agree with what you're saying. What I'm saying is that we're not being allowed, the system as it is now, the right things are there, but they're not being allowed to work in the way that they should. But to my final point, is we in this thing together. Um, since you've been elected to office, Madam Prime Minister, there's one thing you said that always stays with me. We Barbados, I love it. I think everybody should say no, we Barbados. Be because we are all a part of this and we in this thing together. And uh, there is currently a, an atmosphere in education that is not conducive to doing the things that we want to do. There's tension between the students and the teachers, the parents and the teachers, the administration and the teachers. And until we can bring this Cold War type of situation almost to an end, all of the nice things that we want to roll out for education are go not going to be achieved because there is this, this friction among the parties. And go with me here on my final point as I conclude this point. If I have a good student and I have a class of 20 and all 20 become good students, I have a good class. If all of the teachers at the school are able to adopt something similar to me, we have 20 good class, we have a good school. If we have 25 secondary school, got 25 good secondary school, we have a good education system. So we end this thing together, we need to work together and that is the few words I would like to say on education in terms of getting ideas from St. Lucy to be Barbados. Thank you for your indulgence, Madam Prime Minister. I, I also thank you for your frankness. Um, believe you me, Santia is going to be coming about. I'm glad that she's back fully recovered with us. And I imagine that this year is going to be the year when you will see the full extent of her energy and bringing to bear the reform of the system, but also weeding out some of the difficulties. And it's not going to be weeded out without conversation, without talking with each other, rather than talking to and at each other. So thank you, my brother. Thank you, thank you, Madam Prime Minister. Thank you. Drive Hi. safely. <laughs>
I think that I am in a state of amazement here because after returning from university in 1972, it has taken me 48 years to have my Prime Minister come and sit in an atmosphere like this and give all the young people in this country hope where in my life I have virtually given up hope of seeing something like this happen. After every elections, everybody disappeared. You couldn't find anybody. How come my Prime Minister can come and sit down tonight and give all of the young people Prime Minister, I thank you very much. Thank you. I think you have given us a tremendous amount of hope here tonight. I am willing to play my part. I have been in agriculture 48 years. You're going to see in the front row one of the investors who will be investing in agriculture in Barbados in a big way. Uh, we have meetings with the Minister of Agriculture uh, this week and next week and a couple other meetings uh, so we will be helping but like i say for the young people coming in every area of life not only agriculture you have given us tremendous hope tonight thank you thank you sir hi can I, can I say before, um, and, and Puffy, I'm conscious that you're still here. Oba, I know that you are here. Chilling, um, literally. But before you start, I want to make the point, Peter, that St. Lucie has too much land lying down that needs to be turned into productive use. I want, I want, I really, really want the names of those people who are interested seriously in farming so that we can twin people like yourself, sir, with some of the youngsters, the other young man who spoke, because part and parcel of any profession is being exposed to those who are elders in the profession and who can teach by dint of experience. A textbook don't teach you everything that you need to know. You need to be able to talk with people. Jason, I think you were the one who said it that instead of men, fellas rushing out of the dressing room to go to the next event or whatever, that sometimes you just need to sit down and talk. And I can tell you, I, I am conscious that I am probably the last prime minister of this country that would have known and spoken to every prime minister before. It's a fact. So that to that extent, I am probably a bridge to the past, but a bridge to the future. And that in me, I have a responsibility to share because that's the only way people will learn in this business. But whether it is farming or sports or whatever it is, people need to do more sharing and mentoring. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, I think we have about a half hour, so I'm going to try to just frame and get everybody in. And Oba, I know that you were to speak. Um, so that I'm going to bring you to help wrap up at the end. Um, Puffy's going to stay here for now. No, yeah. you're moving here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I'll bring you at the end. Right. Yes, sir. Okay. Hi, good night, everybody. Um, my name good is day. Leo Leroy Carrington, right? I'm a very simple person, and I'm very concerned as well, right? Uh, I'll ask this question to Puffy. I have two very simple questions. You've traveled, obviously, across the world. You've seen a whole set of, a set of things. How would you compare the transportation in other countries compared to the transportation in Barbados. The public transportation, sorry. If you have an opinion on that. Uh, public transportation, I mean, different countries have different means and different ways of doing things. Firstly, let me say that. Um, some methods might work better for other countries than others. You know, some people might have the resources to implement uh, certain means of transportation, while others may not. And I think that's fair to say. Um, 
There's some countries that have really think, good transport systems. I think I help you, Buffy. Transport right. systems and some what that don't. What we want to say is that Barbados's transport system needs modernizing. I'm right. trying and, to and understand that's what exactly. That's in the process of doing. Yeah. Right. Now, I, I totally understand that, right? But I am very deeply concerned because, you know, I've seen a lot of things being implemented recently that I don't, you know, we don't necessarily agree with because, for example, we see a lot of things happening in the industry that is just like really, really ridiculous. Right, like what happened this week with the minibus driver driving on the sidewalk or something like that, Inside right? Inside lane. Yeah, exactly. Those type of things concern me a lot. Madness. Exactly. It's totally madness. And the thing is, we've not seen, you know, anything being done to really help, you know, develop that whole industry. Because at the end of the day, I've never personally seen an industry that has been, that has so much loopholes, so much errors, so much problems in it. And nothing being done about, you know, about changing it and moving I, it forward. I'm not sure that you can say that nothing is being done. Well, no, no. I think in the process, because I think Minister Phillips and Minister Dugit will tell you that they've been in the process of dealing with one, starting to look at how we can work with the drivers and the owners. One of the problems is, is that, especially in the privately owned PSVs, if you pay drivers on the basis of how much they earn. You're asking them to hustle, which means that you're asking them to engage in bad behavior in order to earn Correct. a living. Correct. So the manner of compensation has to change. Secondly, the ministry is supposed to be bringing legislation that will penalize the owners and not just the drivers so that the kind of risks that are being taken right. will be a thing of the past. Thirdly, the easiest way to know whether somebody has gone off route is to have a GPS. And yeah, therefore, we are going to make GPSs mandatory in all forms of public transportation. Yeah. But as a matter also of public safety. So that if people are taken off route or they are wherever that we know how we can find them. Because it is just a matter of public safety. Yeah. You can't be playing to the public without adhering to standards that protect the public. Well, I totally agree with you, to be very honest. And I obviously because I'm not speaking from a point where I'm just, you know, thinking of this today, right? What you just said about, you know, implementing GPS, etc. Why would we implement GPS or how would you implement rather GPS into PSVs, for example, when a owner could go down the road and buy a GPS from Tom, one man could buy GPS from Amazon, and they could all, all control their own GPS. But how does that benefit the passengers of Barbados? How does that benefit anybody else but the owner themselves? Now, the reason I'm saying this is because I'm a very concerned person. And personally, if I have a problem with something, I like to change it. You understand? So about three to four years ago, just to make this very short, we studied the industry a little bit. And what we found was that one of the biggest issues in the industry was control. You know, how do you actually control these people, control the drivers, control if they're going off-road, on-road, control that you just said about the, uh, they're, they're being paid commission, etc. There has to be some better way to do it. And we've managed to do, to do that in what I have done, to be very honest. We've created a company called TransLink Barbados Limited. Some people might have seen it. Some people might not have seen it, to be very honest, where we've actually created an entire platform that merges GPSs, et cetera, onto one, et cetera. Um, you can also, we've actually have like an extremely huge number of PSVs on the platform already. Probably the, the large, really only company that actually has maybe the largest amount of PSVs under one body, to be very honest. We work with tons of drivers across Barbados, and we're trying to bring some type of normalcy to that entire industry, to be very honest. Uh, have you met with the ministry yet? We've met with nearly every single important transportation industry in Barbados, except the transport board, and we've been pushed aside, to be very honest. That's well, the truth. Well, well, fret not thyself, my brother. <laughs> Minister Phillips will make sure that you have the opportunity to meet with the ministry and the transport board. Thank you very much. Take care. What's your name? My name is Leo Leroy Carrington. And I don't think, Leo, I'm glad that you've come here to share this, but this is the point that I want to make. This government is open to ideas and open to airing the house. If we don't do it, I don't know where the next brilliant ideas are coming from. My responsibility is to create a level playing field. And therefore, if we make opportunities available to you, what we've said, look, we get a lot of unsolicited responses. What we do, you write me with an unsolicited um, proposal, sorry. We go out, I've told the ministries, go out and advertise and say, look, 
Is there anybody else who is interested in doing ABC, which is the subject of the unsolicited proposal? If there is, then we assess them on merit. If there isn't, then we go with who is there. So Minister Phillips will make the appointment for you, but I want the innovation. We have a problem in this country, by the way, with scheduling, huh? and that's half the problem at the transport board, the sanitation, Correct. courts, um, private doctors, public doctors, private lawyers, public lawyers, everybody. We have a problem with scheduling and appointments, and we need to be able to use the software and to use also applying our hearts, Karen Goodrich, to wisdom, <laughs> to be able to deal with the issues of scheduling. So, but we can get through it, but we just need to know that it is a problem first. Right, okay. Thank that, you. Thank you very much. Yes? Yes, hi, good evening. Juliet Went. Hi, Juliet, how are you? I'm okay, thank you. How are you? Good to see you. I haven't seen you since school. Since school, since school. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, my comment is with regards to agriculture and food security. And I think that I sincerely and very deeply believe that food security is something that we can achieve. I think we can bring down those imports with very little effort. Um, I have started my growing fruit trees and I found that it's easier than growing vegetables because it requires, you know, less, it's less labor intensive. And um, I think, you know, we have the climate, we have the sun, we have the soil and we have the water. Especially in St. Lucie, we get you know, a lot more rain, I think, than other parts of the island. When it's raining here, it's dry in, in, on the south, oftentimes, I've been told. So I think that um, we definitely, we have the climate where we can do that. Um, my, my, my concern or my, my, my request, really, is that I have been to soil conservation in St. Andrew a few times looking for fruit trees, and oftentimes they don't have. Um, I'm I, I wondering if you all had a bug in my office this morning. <laughs> <laughs> because this is the same convers con conversation I had with soil conservation this morning and the Scotland district thing. So believe you me, a lot of systems have broken down in this country and we're really trying to build back up. And I'm being straight with you. The first 18, 19 months, I spent a large amount of my time trying to stabilize the economy mm -hmm. and trying to stabilize and do the debt restructuring. We are at a stage now where I'm able to start to fine tune and to look with the ministers at certain things because in fairness to them, a lot of ministers would not have had the flexibility while we were also trying to stabilize. We're not out of the woods yet but we can be far more innovative with a number of things that we're doing. And because we've restructured the debt, there are more people coming forward willing to partner with government or to do things with government that give us more options. So I hear you. I know the problem. And I hope that you and others can help us work to be able to propagate the number of fruit trees so that we can share. That's one of the reasons why we've gone with the initiative. Yeah. The other thing is um, with regards to diversity. So I think, um, I think there are a couple of people who are trying to grow different types of fruits. I think in the hotels, people always want fresh tropical fruits. And I think we have the climate that we can have all sorts of, I mean, if you look in, in, in places like the Philippines or you know, anything along that belt, you'll see they have a tremendous amount of different types of fruits. Um, maybe perhaps we could make it easy easier because the same soil conservation has a long list of exotic fruits but they don't really actually can i ask you to meet with them too please with soil conservation i to meet with them yeah not with a view to ask them what they have but with a view to discussing your ideas with them and feeding it in because yeah. that's the only way look if, if the public sector barbados has to be supported by an engaged citizenry and if Barbadians are engaged and we can get public servants willing to meet with them and be getting the ideas flowing both ways, I can tell you that there's going to be a big difference. I also am going to ask Senator Wiggins to speak to you because the truth is that I don't think I've ever seen a greater variety of fruit in my life than I've seen in Suriname. You know what I'm saying? So that we need to look and see what are some of the other things that we can be growing here mm -hmm. and that can survive in this climate. And then also working with farmers down there 
to supplement what we're not doing here. Yep. Okay. Can that work? You know, I, I mean, I like fruit. I, like I Senator Wiggins? Bulk of my fruit. Bulk please. Of my and and I, I'll set up the meeting with Scotland, the the soil conservation with for you, and the high, people down at Highgate says St. Andrew. Yeah? Okay. Thank you. All right, thanks. Good evening, and apologies for saying good evening. I noticed that on the island, everyone says good night, but from England, we say good evening until it's night, time to go to bed. So what I'd like to first of all say is thank you, Prime Minister, for welcoming me back to the island. As you can thank tell, you. I've only as, been as on the, the island nine months. As the Ghanaians will say, Aquaba. <laughs> thank you. Um, as a returning national, I felt that it would be best to try and bring some of what I have learned abroad to the island. So I'm not going to labour th my three points. I'm going to go through them very quickly, and they are all to do with education. The first thing that I would like to try and see if it could be implemented would be a system where at the end of the schooling, for students to be able to be interviewed in the school by the teachers to ask them where they're going and what they're doing and what their plans are going to be moving forward. So that tonight, talking about agriculture, you could collate a group of students who are all interested in agriculture and start working with them to their passion before they change their mind. Um, and that would be the same across every board, every, um, every school. The, the second thing, very quickly, would be um, since I've been, I was an educator 14 years after I left the British Army, and the one most successful thing that we had was a system where students were coaching students from different age groups. And that speaks to the communication of students and being able to articulate things to each other. But what it also did was it made them feel more responsible through their schooling. And that, on this island, would be fantastic in terms of them helping each other and appreciating each other and helping with that, the diversity of things. And, and the, the last thing, which, for me, from a personal point of view... Sorry, actually, I've forgotten it. One second. I have it written down, so I'm not going, I'm not going anywhere. Oh, yes, of course. From a personal point of view, as a head of year which I believe you call a senior teacher here. As a head of year, I found it really, really great for some of our schools collectively in England. We had what we call a, an IFAB panel. And what they did was if there were students who were disaffected in any individual school, um, guidance counselors or assistant heads would meet together. And what they would do is they would offer the student a place in a different school so that they had a new start with new people around them and it would help them to maybe re-engage with school. And that worked really well with students who were uh, not attending. Now, I know you've done this fantastic thing of collating kids and putting them in their central location to work. However, there are a number of students below that who may be turning up, may not be turning up. And it's about getting those people to not have to be shipped off to somewhere to, all, to work together. I'm wondering if we could put together a panel of um, ministers, not ministers, but junior ministers maybe, some representative from all the schools, maybe a guidance counsellor and social services, to be able to talk about individual students who are looking like they are beginning to fall out of the system. That way we will save a lot more of our students, a lot more of our students, before they turn to criminality or, turn, or just fall off the system. I take it you were in education in England? I was, yes. Have you met with anybody in the ministry here yet? Can I be honest and open? Yeah. I have written you a letter, and you have answered, um, but I've not heard anything since, so I have done. Well, let, let me try and get, because the ministry has had a number of major changes in the yeah. last few months. So let us arrange for you to meet with somebody from the ministry and see how best you can work in the system because we need all good people helping from all different angles. That's the truth. Okay? Thank you very so, much um, for your ear. Can I, can I ask, where's, jo where's... Oh, no, I don't need to get paid. Oh, no. well, maybe once. Make it big. 
um, Kalila can't see the others, but can you take his information for me and let us make sure we can link him? Thanks. Thank you very much for the chance to speak. You're most welcome, sir. Um, Puffy, I know you may have to run off, or you're good? Yeah, yeah. You have to run off. In a few, yeah. That, uh, that's cool. So I just want to thank you um, for being here. And I want to say to the chap and others who started, I think that the idea also was to be able to have persons come and help us break the ice to get these conversations going. Surely. And against that background, I really want to thank Jason, yourself, um, over, over, I know you're now coming back home. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> but if you want to speak, feel free to come um, to the mic. We've got about four or five others. We have until just about 9.30. So if we can move through quickly, because we're conscious that people need also to get back to where they're going. Yes, sir. Good evening, Prime Minister. Good evening to the audience. I want to thank you for, the, for this important developmental conversation, and that is where I'm going to begin in posing my question. What is the commitment of your government in mainstreaming disability in these development conversations <clears throat> and, in, and in development generally? Um, that's one of the things that I, I want to find out. Uh, we had an extensive set of interaction about education here this evening, and I know that your government is committed to educational reform, and I want to find out to what extent will that process involve persons with disabilities and center their issues. You were portfolio minister at the time we started mainstreaming persons with disabilities into regular, into quote unquote normal schools, and I, I wonder, and I, I imagine you wonder as well, about the extent to which it has been a success. What metrics are we using to measure the success? And are we removing the impediments to mainstreaming persons with disabilities in our, in our schools? Look, I believe that if you care enough, you have to make the steps to make a difference. Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons why the first area of teacher reform and teacher training that un was undertaken when I was Minister of Education was special needs education to be able to facilitate the mainstreaming to which you spoke. Mm -hmm. Part of the difficulty is that a lot of things that we put in place, I've learned, have in fact been stalled or removed. Absolutely. And that's why we're trying to recalibrate the system. I'll give mm -hmm. you a small example. We used to test every child at three mm -hmm. and five years old for hearing, speech, and sight impediments. Mm -hmm. Why? Because if the child had a disability or a lack of capacity in hearing or in speech or in sight, you'd be in a position to deal with it. And the truth is, whether we like it or not, the numbers are usually between about 7-8% of people who will normally have a problem straight off. That has been abandoned. Mm -hmm. Now, I would like to say to you that I could start it back straight, mm -hmm. but we're in an IMF program where we're also having to try to build back critical things that have dropped, mm -hmm. and therefore we are going to do all of these things, but we have to do them as we build and as we start to grow. So that commitment is there. With respect to accessibility at schools or in public spaces, I've said to the Minister of Public Works that we need to be able to have a, 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 the, the, a program that looks at making all of the sidewalks in our main towns, starting with them, accessible. Mm -hmm. And after our main towns, we then need to look at Highway 1 and Highway 7 across the board. Mm -hmm. But with the best will in the world, it has to be done over time because, as I said, I don't have a full deck of money to play with. So, believe you me, the commitment is there, and we will continue to deal with it. Similarly, we need to be able, and we've done it with the amendment of the procurement rules. I would imagine that the most difficult thing for a parent who has a child who is differently able is wondering what is going to happen to that child when that parent passes on. And I've agreed that our government has, through its procurement, mm -hmm. to begin to ensure that a percentage of our procurement is reserved for persons who are differently able 
so that we can make sure that they can sustain themselves and make a basic living. And we're in the process now of being able to do that. The management, um, the, pro the procurement, new procurement rules, we've already done some amendments, but we need now to do further amendments and also to introduce the policies across ministries that can look out and see what are the things that persons who are differently able are in fact producing. It's against that background that I think that the charitable work done by the Derek Smith um, School in my constituency is absolutely critical because what it is also doing is training people not just at the age of school level but young adults too. A range of skills from culinary arts right back through to wood um, and pottery and a whole art, a whole host of things. And they have the little shop there at the front where, as you know, they sell stuff also that is as a result of the production of persons. I thank you for your, for your multiple and various commitments. Um, I'm going to ask that you consider mainstreaming disability in that reform conversation that, that Minister Bradshaw is going to engage in. Agreed. I am going to also ask that to, we consider um, adding equal opportunity legislation or non-discrimination legislation to the legislative agenda very soon. Thank yeah. you. Uh, we will take it on board. But it's a good thing to see you, and I feel very proud to see you and how far you've come, truly. Thank you. Well Thank done. you, love. Good night. Yes, ma'am. So, I know that Puffy mentioned earlier about using social media to reach out to persons that have been successful in their industry. For me, I would say that I use social media not just for the glamour, what young persons may use it for, but I reach out and to people that I would say are like-minded and are somewhere along the same journey that I am on. I have reached out, they have helped me, but... What do you do? Well, I have dreams to be a motivational speaker and help person. So what I am asking you right now is if you could get persons like Oprah, persons like Warren Buffett to, <laughs> to get time from their busy schedule to actually visit and help young persons in this country, like me who have reached... I know it's a lot to ask. No, don't but I'm mind, just don't asking. mind, don't mind the people who are trying to distract you. Listen, whether I will certainly tell you that we will try, but I also want you to recognize that there are some people locally and regionally who can also give you that same experience. And I, part of the thing is is that the, the social media and the and the media that we have mm -hmm. creates a celebrity culture. But within our region are some of the bright, brightest and best people that you will ever meet. Have you ever 100%. met Sagari? No, please. Well, when you ever, if you ever listen to Sagari, and, and Jason can tell you that you are probably going to meet one of the most humble men that you could ever meet, but full of wisdom and full of capacity to le lend his knowledge and expertise to you about what life is about in the same way that Jason did. Similarly, I'm sure that Puffy would tell you, Rihanna, believe you me, is one of the most gracious and humble people that you will ever meet. So I, f I think what we're going to have to try and do is to create platforms for Barbadian and Caribbean people also who have succeeded to share their story because in a very real way, they may have more in common with you and where you are at than Warren Buffett might be able to have. As much as we want to hear Warren Buffett. Okay, Does thank you. Does that make sense? Yes, please, and I look forward to it. But I also thank you for your courage. What's your name? Zaria Griffith. Um, and you're finished school now or what? No, I'm at BCC studying media and journalism. Oh, yes. I see. <laughs> I must well, commend you. Can, can, can I say to you that in this audience, there are three people that you need to speak to before you leave. And I'm going to put them in the middle of it. <laughs> One, Roy Morris, my press secretary, is a former managing editor of newspapers. That's my Two. teacher. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you can leave him one side for now. <laughs> then there is Carol Roberts somewhere in here who 
is hiding behind doing Grisette out there. <laughs> but who... I don't know that there are many better interviewers than Carol Roberts when it comes to interviewing people. And then there is Dr. Leacock, who is an exceptional broadcast journalist and who also was managing, what was it, general manager of CBC in her day as well. And I'm sure that they can do more for you at the moment than Warren Buffett. Thanks. I must commend her on choosing the, um, the, the motivational speaker route, though, because that's something unorthodox. You know, you don't yeah. really hear kids coming up wanting to do something like that. So. In fact, there was another young lady at Frederick Smith School again who came up and who expressed the same desire and who recognized that the power of motivation among her peers Absolutely. is something that she could do mm -hmm. and had the ability to do. Mm -hmm. So I think that you'll find a lot more people. And as you said, what a motivational speaker does is to allow us to reflect and think. I used to get up in the morning and the first thing I used to do is pick up my phone. I confess now <laughs> that this job has brought me to the state where the first thing I do is to keep my eyes closed for a half hour and meditate. <laughs> and, and, and I do it for good reason. Because I need the time to meditate, to pray, and to be able then to order my thoughts for the day. And there are things that you read that you may want to reflect on at that point in time. So whether it is motivational speakers or motivational writers, Puffy? You never know. Yep. You need them. I, I think you can do some too. Yeah? <laughs> um, good night, everyone. Uh, my question is really on entrepreneurship. Me as a young entrepreneur from St. Lucie and having to go out you know, into the world of work, work at a couple places, Ministry of Labor and other places as well, before I decided to start my own business. Well, not really deciding to start my own business because it, I was forced to start my own business because I was, um, it was in the retrenchment program and I lost my job then. And the last six years of entrepreneurship has been very hard for me um, in terms, I guess, with the economic decline and stuff. And I mean... How, how long, what have you been doing and how long have you been doing it? Um, well, we do things like print t-shirts and brain like lessons and different little things like that that we do, not advertising at all. Um, you know, we bring, Go right ahead and advertise, my brother. All right. Um, it's been very hard in terms of bringing things and trying to sell back to people. You know, you, you, you want to make a profit, you don't want to kill people, and it's very hard. You still got to pay rent, still got to pay staff, and I want to know, like, what... I think in fairness to you, you you've been set out on a path of entrepreneurship at probably one of the worst times in this country's history economically. I pray, and that's why we're working as hard as we are, that we can see growth return and that we can have the disposable income that we're increasing in people's pockets, be able to make a difference to entrepreneurs like yourself. You. So let me also give an example. 15 years ago, 10 years ago, there were a lot of people in what I call lifestyle-related industries, people doing manicures and pedicures and more gardeners and landscapers and different types of things. And once the economy started to contract, all of the things that were optional got cut out of people's budget. One of the reasons why in last year's budget we did the amendments to the income tax was to start to put more money in people's pocket. One of the reasons why we're settling Clico and British American and trying to be able to do all of the payments that we have to do is that the more money we can put back out there because the government of Barbados has owed a lot of people for a long time. When we became the government, we discovered that the government owed away $1.9 billion, of which $1.4 was to third parties, and $500 million was to government agencies. Now, we've been bringing that down significantly. But in bringing it down, it means that between that and the economy growing, that people will now start, hopefully, to hire people that they were not using before, go for money, buy T-shirts, do things that they weren't doing before so that money is turned in the economy again. And once the construction industry comes back full-blown, what does the average construction worker do at 2, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon? I don't need to tell you. 
but you get what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah, maybe what I'm trying to tell you is don't give up. Right. Because I think that the economy is about to turn the corner mm -hmm. and that the opportunities are going to be there for you. You've gone through the school of hard knocks. It's true. But you are now going to be in a position to be able to see how best you can meet the demand. Because remember, you also got to sell what people want. It's true. Not what you think you should sell. <laughs> And therefore, that's why the market surveys are doing the informal things to see where the need is and the demand is so that you can meet the need. Right. Um, right? And I want to say that we also want to have some financial literacy clinics established regionally major. in the north, major. in the center, in the south, so that people can come and learn informally and also to see, especially with the banks only paying you 0.01% on interest for savings, how best you can invest a portion of your savings in yeah, other things. And actually get a return. And get a return. You got it, my yeah. brother. And, you know, I would like to say, you know, thank you for your points as well. And I guess on behalf of me and my company and the people of St. Lucie, I could not really leave here without giving you, without leaving this gift with you. And I hope that you appreciate it and that you love it. Thank you. Sounds bright too. Hold, hold a minute, because <laughs> you apologizing for advertising, but I ain't gonna advertise you. <laughs> that means that I can now be a come an adopted Lucian. <laughs> I now know where I got to get key rings from. <laughs> Thank you so much, my brother. Thank you very much. What's your name? Brian Gooding. Sorry? Brian Gooding. Brian Gooding. And where do you operate from? Palmetto Street next to the Parliament Building. So everybody who needs T-shirts, cups, or key rings, Brian Gooding, Palmetto Street. <laughs> Next one, hey. we're gonna start wrapping up. So these are the last three people. Prime Minister. All right, hello, good night, sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to um, ask, you know, like what you have like plans as regard bringing water harvesting for the agriculture, because within Barbados, most of the agriculture is really rain fed agriculture. And you, we actually produced a lot of things that, um, with the elements and you have climate change and all of that. If we would do things like capture quite a lot of the water that run off farms and things like that, we could actually move from the, um, like when, when the, the, um, from the rainy, rainy season right into the dry season, because the the the, the 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 climate situation has really changed drastically Agreed. Agreed. within agriculture, you have another problem, a serious problem with the monkeys. I think, and I I don't hear anybody really talking about addressing that whatsoever. If we do the rainwater harvesting, you would find that small farmers could be able, and and. It has to be done where you actually produce these things. You, you, you actually need to have greenhouses and that type of thing. You need to also regulate the, you know, you're using the fans where you have the um, solar, solar energy and you put the, the fans to the west of the greenhouse and then to the east you have um, water chiller and that, you know, causes the Air, air, to regulate the, the, the temperature within the, the, the greenhouse condition. So I, I feel that if this is done, we could produce a lot more within Barbados. And if you deal with the monkey situation, we could produce a lot, lot more. Well, what's your name, sir? Michael Braffitt. 
Mr. Braffer, I uh, want to thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Water Resources. The issue of rainwater harvesting is something that we've started to talk about, yeah. largely because, like you, many others have come up and said, look, too much water is just running into the sea, whether it is here, whether it is in St. Philip, other parts. And if we can dam some water and also have the water available for farmers through the harvesting. And you know what would be a good idea? In the schools and things like that, we need to actually do some rainwater harvesting within the school environment. And things like the, the flushing of the toilets and all of that type of thing, where you have demonstration fields within the schools, we should have those fitted out where people could be able to grow under greenhouse conditions. Because if we talking about agriculture and you don't take the uncertainty out of it because this climate change situation, this is a, a, a huge threat to farming. Dread. So unless these things are really done, and we, you have to look at the best people in this thing. You gotta look at the Israelis, and you have to look at those examples and if that is done in Barbados, you could find that quite a lot of production could be done because you could, you could have small farmers growing onions, high value crops, and you wouldn't be constrained by having to the wait on the rain and all of that. The I will you. share this with you. One of the things that agriculture shared with me, onion production was significantly up last year. Mm -hmm. And we want to be able to make sure it can continue to increase because there's no reason why we should be importing onions about here. Okay, but okay. I thank you, and um, perhaps I can talk to you from St. Lucie, no? Yeah. So, I, 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 do you have a relationship with the schools in St. Lucie? No. But perhaps I can help to build a bridge between you. Minister Phillips is still here. If we can build a bridge with you and the schools in terms of the agriculture, because I know that the Darrell Jordan School has a little area there, and the other primary schools need to have it as well. Yes. Hey, good night, um, everybody. My name is Theolika. Um, I apologize in advance for any grammatical errors I may make. I don't have a lot of experience don't, in public don't, speaking. Don't, don't, don't sweat that, sir. All right, so I'll be brief. The two topics I really want to touch on are e-commerce and manufacturing. So I'll start with e-commerce. Um, I think it would be great if we can have a platform where we can have all Barbadian businesses aggregated onto a single platform for, each, for that would be, make it easy to find so that basically there will be a lot of convenience where it comes to shopping um, locally. And the, you mentioned the CSME earlier. Um, we can really take advantage of that okay. with the free movement of goods and services. Also, this would be good for entrepreneurship in terms of having a digital uh, online space for stores and businesses where you can search your favorite store and search their products and everything and basically find everything that you need in one place where everything is regularly updated Whereas in contrast with stores now, you basically we don't have a good online presence with stores in Barbados. In other words, one that is there that will drive traffic to it because exactly. people know it's a central exactly. thing. Exactly, a high traffic yep. marketplace basically. No so problem. I, I think this would be a really good idea. Um, I think me, so too. I have a team that have embarked on this project and we're actually in, in works of it. So that would be really good for people to really don't have to worry about the, the stifling cost of rent and overheads and stuff like that. Can I ask you when you finish to come and meet Jonathan here? Yes, he has. Yeah, he's spoken to Jonathan, yeah. Okay, and yeah. uh, we'll work on it. Thanks, what's your Thank name? You. My name is Theo Likot. Thank you. Yeah, um, one more thing, it would be manufacturing. I think it would be great if Barbados could be self-sufficient when it comes to manufacturing. Um, right now we're in Industry 4.0, a digital revolution, and Right now, Barbados is a sleeping giant when it comes to technology. Uh, because of the small size, Barbados is able to capitalize on technology way faster than bigger countries like, let's say, the UK or United States or anything. So um, what, what would you say if we could manufacture bus parts, obsolete bus parts? Because we have a huge problem with obsolete. We can manufacture those bus parts in 24 hours and for a fraction of the price that you have to pay um, and, and go through complex supply chains to get them into Barbados. You're thinking of what kind of manufacturing process through 3D Digi printing? Yeah, digital manufacturing, 3D I printing. I tell you, I swear you all had a, a, a bug in my office, in the cabinet office today, okay. because I spoke to IDC about us being able to create a special purpose vehicle that looks at 
investing in areas where the private sector is reluctant to take the first step yeah. because they're risk averse. It happens all the time. The, Errol Barrow built the Hilton because the private sector at the time would not have built a hotel of that scale. So sometimes you have to have state entrepreneurial activity in order to lead the way. Exactly. So I definitely agree that we need to develop some 3D printing capacity. Yeah. They're looking at the feasibility of it. I can't tell you offhand I actually, until they come sorry. back with the report. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, my, my company I actually have a comprehensive proposal on the table if you want I'd to take a to look see, at it. I'd love to see yeah, it. Um, we can do things like, like I said, that's only a, a tip of the iceberg. Like, let's say in case of um, climate change and coral bleaching, we see a reduction in the coral reefs in Barbados and the wider region. Um, we can actually manufacture coral in complex ways that were not before possible through digital manufacturing to encourage the growth of coral algae to grow more corals and we can let, actually do something. Let Johnson stuff. set up a meeting. Um, I got to finish the estimates process the next week, 10 days. Yeah. Um, then I'm taking literally a break for six or seven days. Yes. When I come back early February, I'd like to meet with you. That'll okay. Be great. I look Thank forward to it. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Yes. All right. I had said um, three, but I'll take the fourth and this is it. Yes, sir, and then I'll take you, ma'am. Okay. My name is Wendell Clark. I want to um, say tonight that if you had to take a vote on the speeches that were made tonight, you'll see that 75% of them was done recommending agriculture. And I want to add to that percentage as well. Mm -hmm. I want to say that I think agriculture is going to be the answer for this country. I love my country, and I want to make sure that it succeeds in everything I do. I, want, I think agriculture is what we prefer to offer is what we call sustainable development. Mm -hmm. And this is what this country needs at this particular time. We don't want to be doing development here today and then tomorrow we'll go back and build back up. So I think agriculture lends all the length for manufacturing, all the things that you can just imagine. I look and see the history of most developed countries and the basis was always agriculture. So we know the answer. And I think now that we have to go forward and make sure that we can do it. Thank it is you. stated that in the Western Hemisphere, we are very good at talking, but we are very slow at implementing. And I, th I don't want this. I hope that what is said here tonight be captured in a form that it will be implemented. I, I hope that it's done. I further want to say that just to lend some of my history, I want to add to what you said tonight, what we discover, this, this peculiar things to Barbados and agriculture. We talk about the great fruit and all those other things, that's correct. But in my experience, a couple of years ago, I had vacation, I was vacationing in Boston, and I decided to go around to look at the supermarket shelves to see if there were anything on the shelves that come from Barbados. Trust me, saw nothing then. My passion then was to come back to Barbados to make sure when I get back home that I make sure something on the shelves in the USA come from Barbados. Those, and those years ago, I was president of the Barbados Small Business Association. And you probably remember um, there was a particular pepper sauce by Lottie's. Yeah. We, had, we have and several pepper sauces. Barbados, there's no pepper sauce in the world as good as pepper sauce from Barbados. <laughs> None, not once forever. So much so that in Colombia and them, they, they decided to copy the Barbadian pepper sauce and call it Barbadian style pepper sauce. <laughs> so these are things that we have that based from agriculture. I also remember years ago that we were doing something yam flakes. We don't yam flakes from Barbados. And then, then there was an attempt even to send the pepper sauce to Germany. And when the Germans began to order the pepper sauce, the people can't produce and we, uh, we operate like a ghost. So we need to plan this. And this part, part of it is production and part of it is also making sure that we have HACCP compliant spaces yes. and that we also deal with these phytosanitary issues. So once again today, I mean, it's just fortuitous. Right. I've made the point to the IDC that they need to give me a project cost for what it will take sector by sector for us to make a number of industries HACCP compliant. 
because without that, we're only fooling ourselves. Secondly, for 12, 13 years, we've been complaining that we can't export to Europe because we don't have the phytosanitary legislation and the labs, etc. And I've said to the um, Director General of Foreign Trade, come up with the program as to what it will take so that we can remove this obstacle, because it's almost embarrassing now that other smaller countries in the Caribbean can export fish to Europe, and we can't. That's right. Okay? Right. And last but not least, I just want to say this, that over the years, our soil is most depleted. And we have a situation where they find that the tests have just come out and show that there's a lot of calcium in our soils, and our sugarcane yields is dropping per acre. I want to say to you that we have, our company currently have approximately, approximately 20,000 liters of organic fertilizer that we can assist in the, in the country and provide into the country. And I would like the ministry to work with us so we can start giving this out to our soils because we need it, because the soils need that kind of fertilizer to, in order to build back up the soil so that all of these things we're talking about, we can get some good production. I'm sure you can speak to the ministry, but in addition to that, we also would have received a gift from the Moroccans of 160,000 tons of fertilizer to that I've been speaking only today again with the Minister of Agriculture about it. Today I did agriculture, as you can hear, and I did industry and international business. So uh, agriculture is coming back to me on Saturday at 10, and I'll raise it with them. But I think you need to be speaking to them directly as well. Okay. But we do, you're absolutely correct, we do have a soil problem. Mm -hmm. And we have to be able to build back up our soils. And that's what we're working on to see how best we can do it. And I said to the ministry, not just for government-owned plantations, please. It has to be island-wide. Okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Good night. My name is Kalia Bellamy. I am an entrepreneur, a journalist, but most importantly, I am a young female professional. Um, I had the opportunity in September to attend the 74th sitting where you, Prime Minister, addressed the United Nations General Assembly. Uh, I wrote an article which was published in Nationwide, and it was received very warmly. A lot of people communicated with me on their thoughts about it. On, as, as well as my social media publications while I was in New York. So to follow up of Puppy's comment, which I really agree, I want to further the conversation. Um, I have a lot of platforms where I have the availability. I work with a lot of creatives um, in Barbados who are interested in getting involved, um, but we just need the extra support and to further the conversation, whether that's about climate change or something that I personally face, which is being a female that enters a room full of professional men or older professionals. And I just want to open that conversation to people who are interested in having the conversation of continuing my article and as a follow-up about climate change, uh, as that pertains to the development of Nationwide or just any publication out there. All right. Can I ask you to do me and engage with two people? One, Roy Morris, and two, Jonathan to see how we can work with you and others. Look, the reason why these sessions are so good is that I'm leaving here knowing more about Barbados and what Barbadians are doing than when I came. And sometimes you feel, oh, you know, it's tired, you had long days, but this is what makes it worth it. Because I really do believe that within this country, there is a tremendous amount of talent that just needs to be unleashed. We may not always get it right, but we have to stay the course and keep trying. And I ask those of you, like yourself, to therefore be able to interact with the others and see from that interaction what space that can be created to be able to allow yourself and others to be able to share. I don't see, for example, why CBC at night is not allowing people like yourself to be able to share and have a platform to speak to other young people or other Barbadians. And I think those are some of the things that we need to open up for people like yourself. And by having that green screen, Puffy, and those computers, etc., it may be that you can do your own productions and put for people like Puffy, or I must confess myself now because of my time, that look more at the internet than TV itself or traditional television. So we need to be able to get it out there in as many formats as we can by facilitating the productions. 
Okay. Yes, I'm definitely interested. And while I was at the UN, um, a lot of people were interacting with my page, and I asked them, were they watching the live stream? And honestly, it, their answer was no. And it wasn't that they weren't interested, it's that it wasn't communicated at their level, yeah. and well, at our level, because I put myself in that room. I put myself in that position to have that, but a lot of people don't have that resource or that opportunity, and I definitely want to continue the conversation about climate change alone, and as well as simple things as placing yourself in rooms that really you can make a difference. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. So I really want to thank all of you who have come out. But before we close, I had indicated that I really want to invite Oba you to be able to do some of the closing remarks and to give a perspective. As a young Barbadian who has left for some time, your perspective as to where we are, where you think we can go, and what you think needs to be done in order for us to be able to move forward. Because sometimes it's easier to see when you're outside and come back than if you're in the middle of it all. Because I also think that sometimes we are harsher on ourselves without realizing what we have within us and the resilience that we have. So, Oba, I'm going to allow you to close the event. I'm not going to speak any further tonight. After you, Roshana will shut down and thank everybody. But I want, from my part, to sign off and say thank you and God bless, and let's keep the conversation going. Oba. Thank you, Madam Prime Minister. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it has been a great privilege to be here this evening. Um, I particularly like the engagement, the format, and I think it's important that we talk to each other. You know, we live in the, the world, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of it too, of using my phone, but there's much to be said about talking. You know, the empathy, the, the ability to make your point, the ability to, to wrestle with ideas. And the things that we're talking about is nation building. The Prime Minister spoke about the importance, I'm going to put it in my terms, of legacy. It's so important to think beyond just ourselves and to think about what type of society do we want? What type of world do we want those that come after us to live in? You know, we're bombarded with so many things, especially, you know, now the access to the internet and all these ideas. And the question that we have to face is, who will we be as Barbadians slash Bajans? And these type of conversations are important. I learned a lot just from listening to the questions, listening to the answers, listening to, to DJ Puffy, listening, of course, to the Prime Minister, listening to so many comments. And I think that has to be what we continually do, to listen, to learn, to show interest, to engage. But beyond that, it's important that we do. One thing that I've found is that, particularly in Barbados, we like to have robust conversations, call-in programs, and, and all these other things. That's fine and good, because it's important that people express themselves, get their ideas out. But more than anything else, it comes down to what do we do? And what do we do individually? Which then becomes the collective part. It, it aggregates, and that's how we move forward. And so my challenge to you is just like my challenge to myself and, and the challenge that we should always keep in mind is what can I, the individual, do? A lot of people look to just government. There's only so much government can do regardless of whoever is there. The only limited number of people actually in governance and in the government itself and in any organization who are leaders but there's so many more people who have the ability to do things. And so that's the challenge that I leave with you all tonight. Hopefully we will continue to have these conversations. I think it's very important. I think it's so very important that we just focus on who do we want to become? Well, first, who are we? Who do we want to become? And how do we get there? And as we continue to have these conversations, we set the platform for our lives and for the lives of those that come before us. 
Thank you all for coming out tonight. I'm assuming, oh, no, I'm not left to leave that final remark. But thank you very much. Good night once again, everyone. Um, I want to take this, make this very short. I want to thank Prime Minister Mia Moore Motley. Um, I want to thank Puffy, um, Obadali Thompson, um, <laughs> Jason Holder, Honorable Peter Phillips, and the Parish Organizing Committee, the CEO and staff of the NCF, the entire technical team and service providers. Canon, Curtis Goodridge, um, the media, everyone who has come out, who has supported. And I also want to thank you, the people of St. Lucie, for hosting us tonight. It has been a pleasure to be here. And we cannot wait to see what else is happening in the month of January for our gathering. So thank you once again. I hope you had a great night and get home safely. Protege, eh? Yeah.